tends to shine that light on that supply chain to ensure that everyone has got a fair share of every pound spent on dairy produce. Many thanks. And that concludes topical questions. And we now move on to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 12034 in the name of Keith Brown on protecting public services. I invite members who wish to speak in this debate to press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. And I call on the Cabinet Secretary, Keith Brown, to speak to and move the motion. Cabinet Secretary, 14 minutes, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer. This debate gives us the opportunity to reflect on the importance of our public services and the vital role that they play uh, for the spectrum of people that teach, they treat and serve our communities everywhere and in so many different ways. And I could mention, of course, the uh, continuing progress of Pauline Cafferke, who I'm sure the Chamber will be very happy to hear is now no longer in a critical condition, somebody who uh, treats many people both here and abroad. We heard in the Chamber last week that as the economy recovers, growth must be balanced and sustainable. And the Scottish Government is clear about its responsibility for setting the vision of a fair, equitable and sustainable Scotland. And at the heart of this vision is the importance of high quality public services and their power to enhance quality of life and improve economic opportunities for all. I believe the people of Scotland also place a high value on our public services and increasingly recognise that the role of public services is crucial in reducing inequalities. It is a shared value and it is essential to ensuring a sustainable economic recovery which all can benefit from. But UK government austerity has not just slowed economic recovery but it continues to undermine it. This is an asymmetrical austerity where those least able to are those shouldering the greatest burden. And with an absence of fairness, we can't have true prosperity. And five years of austerity already imposed by Westminster has resulted in real-term cuts and is more, much more to come. And we have challenged this wrong-headed approach on many occasions in this chamber and beyond, and will continue to do so. But we now face the very unwelcome prospect of austerity lasting for a decade or more, regardless of which Westminster party forms a government in May. And despite their cuts, ours is a different approach in Scotland, and we will continue to invest and prioritise our work to protect and enhance public services as far as we are able to, using the powers available to this Parliament. At this difficult time for people, we are protecting household budgets through the provision of services and policies that make up the social wage, sometimes characterised in debate as universal services. We remain committed to freezing council tax, to abolishing or continuing with the abolition of prescription charges, maintaining free higher education, free eye examinations and concessionary travel, and ensuring free personal care for the elderly. And this commitment underpins the Scottish Government's commitment to fairness. Uh, I will come back to Neil Finlay shortly. Uh, this commitment underpins the Scottish Government's commitment to fairness, prevention, and value for money. And if I can just give the example of the National Concessionary Travel Scheme for older and disabled people, this has important health and social benefits, with evidence that it promotes socialising and leisure, especially among older people on low incomes. Uh, and a recent measure also worth noting in this context is a recent announcement to expand uh, free school meals to every primary one and three child, which will save families of every eligible child at least £330 a year. And I would say to uh, Neil Finlay, the Labour Party, it would be interesting to know whether he agrees with Jim Murphy that Ian Gray was completely wrong uh, in relation to free uh, uh, meals, or whether, uh, in relation to Jim Murphy's assertion, that uh, Ian Gray was completely right. Uh, perhaps he can elucidate for us when uh, Jim Murphy had his meltdown on Sunday as to which he believed, uh, whether he believed in universal services or didn't believe in those. And what, what is the position, if I allow Neil Finlay to come in, what is the position of Labour's Cuts Commission now? Neil Finlay. Uh, one of the best ways to uh, keep money in people's pockets is to keep them in employment. I wonder if the Minister can advise me how many jobs have gone in local government under his regime? Uh, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I think, uh, unlike many Labour authorities, this uh, government has continued with its approach of no compulsory redundancies, and I think that's protected uh, workforces. And the crucial point, and the reason for that was, of course, it provided security both for those employees, uh, speaking as a former local government employee myself, and their families during a time of recession to know that their job would be safe. Uh, I think it was an important point, and it's part of what we term as a social wage for public sector employees. We've also taken a very distinctive approach to reform. Uh, along with this, and guided by the findings of the Christie Commission, the Scottish Government is pursuing an ambitious programme of public service reform focused on improving outcomes for people. 
a clear strategic direction for service transformation is now well established, and that's built around four pillars. Working in partnership, engaging and developing the people who deliver our services, continually improving performance, and making a decisive shift to prevention. And a wide range of reform has already been delivered nationally and locally, and a shared ambition is established across the public service landscape to build upon these foundations and increase the pace and scale of positive change. And I'll give way to Gavin Brown. Gavin Brown. I'm grateful to him for giving way. In terms of preventative spend, what evidence has he got that the £500 million has had an impact on outcomes? Cabinet Secretary. Well, there's evidence from the change funds which are being established and also the benefits in terms of uh, more efficient public services. But there's also evidence, if he cares to look at, for example, the user survey on concessionary travel, which itemises some of the benefits. That is, that is preventative spend. Well, perhaps the member doesn't believe that providing a free bus travel for our pensioners and disabled people prevents further problems or indeed free prescription charges. But I can assure him, no, I've just answered the point. I can assure him those things do provide long-term benefits in bearing down on public expenditure, as well as the £500 million, which has been found by John Swinney. Let's not forget, forget at a time of huge constraint on public finances. We've taken the tough decision to address reform, which has never been taken by the previous administrations, either in this place or at Westminster. And we've invested a great deal of time and effort into a wide-ranging programme of public service reform, from establishing single services for police and fire to college mergers and the establishment of the Early Years Collaborative. And the successful transition to single police and fire services is an example of the decisive action being taken in Scotland to protect the resources available to us and to ensure continued frontline presence and delivery. And events such as the Clutha Bar tragedy and the more recent George Square crash remind us how important frontline services are. And great progress, to come back to the point raised but again by uh, Gavin Brown, great progress has already been made towards delivering the projected savings by Police Scotland of £1.1 billion by 2026, with approximately £880 million of sustainable and recurring savings secured. And we'll also spend £100 million this year mitigating the coalition welfare cuts in Scotland. We'll increase the number of free childcare to 30 hours for all three and four year olds by 2020 make real terms increases in NHS spending in each year of the next Parliament, and make payment of the living wage a central priority of all Scottish uh, Government contracts. In education, we have continued to invest in Scotland's schools for the future, despite the cuts to our capital budget. Uh, the total investment for the programme between the Scottish Government and local authorities is £1.8 billion. On the 2nd of January, we announced more than £2 million of funding for an extra 250 places for people to start teacher training next year. We recognise that the future of the profession is important and we are investing in it. And in the NHS, only last week, the First Minister announced further spending to fund specialist nurses. These nurses will have a direct impact on people in real need. And Scotland's public service workers who teach, who treat, protect and serve our communities are amongst the greatest assets that we have. And I would thank them for their passion, their commitment and their hard work. And just to mention, uh, as has been mentioned already in topical questions, that some of our emergency workers face, although we expect it of them, face absolutely horrendous situations on many occasions. One uh, dramatic situation in my own constituency recently involving the death of a child. But we mentioned the Clutha tragedy and, of course, George Square. And they are people as well, and they are affected by some of the work that we ask them to do on our behalf. Uh, but that's also one of the reasons why we want to thank them for their passion and their hard work, but also why the Scottish Government is committed to a distinctive pay policy. Uh, and that policy uh, that's fair supports those on the lowest incomes. And I will take a, an intervention from Duncan McNeill. Duncan McNeill. Heading in this direction to, to commend the work of those who are not employed by the public sector, who do valuable work daily delivering public services. Where's the fair deal for them in terms of jobs and wages? Well, I'm coming on to the point about jobs and wages, but of course we are responsible for those that we directly employ and also for the other public bodies. But the point that Duncan McNeill quite rightly makes about many of those who are not directly employed, many are volunteers, and I think my colleague Richard Lockhead was very careful to make sure that we thank them for their efforts, for example, people working in the seas around Scotland as well. But we are also clear that we should have uh, fair uh, pay, we should support those on lowest incomes and protect public sector jobs and services whilst also delivering value for money for the people of Scotland. Uh, we are clear that senior pay packages should be in step with the salary, the terms and conditions offered to other staff. And we also remain committed to a policy of no compulsory redundancies, and we've extended that until 2016. Uh, it's also worth pointing out, of course, in relation to the NHS, we have implemented the Agenda for Change wage increase for nurses 
because that's not happened in England, and believe it or not, that's not happened in Wales either. But we have stayed with the, the recommendation for Agenda for Change, and although we believe it's, of course, a small increase, 1%, we have paid that where others have not done that. We want to support the public sector workforce and for every individual, no matter what their role or the area that they work in, to feel utterly, no, I'll make some more progress if I can, to feel utterly empowered to formulate the responses required to deliver the services that meet the needs and expectations of society. Operating in a culture where people feel they can deliver reform and improvement at the local level. That's an essential element of Scotland's approach to service transformation. Now, the recent announcement by the Conservative, Conservative Party on limiting public sector strikes, I think, is just one example of the different type of relationship with the workforce that ministers north and south of the border are seeking to forge. In this, of course, we have the Tories mimicking the Labour 1970s habit of introducing 40% rules to try and rig ballots. <laughs> Um, and that, of course, uh, backfired on the Labour Party when they ushered in 18 years of Tory government. Perhaps that explains why the Tories are so keen on it. But what can't be explained, what can't be explained is why Labour uh, argued vehemently in the Smith Commission to keep trade union law in the hands of the Tories rather than the hands yeah. of the people of Scotland. Yeah. <laughs> uh, much more is being done with the programme for government and it shows our ambition and the passion to deliver an alternative plan in a different way. We recognise the full range of strengths, abilities and capacities found in all sectors and that it's key. Public, third sector, to come back to the point by Duncan McNeill, and private organisations must work closely in partnership with communities and with each other to design and deliver excellent public services which meet the needs of local people. And through community planning partnerships and single outcomes agreements, uh, we are seeking to support public and third sector partners to come together uh, and share budgets to achieve outcomes. If we are to tackle inequalities, power must be balanced. And we do have to tackle inequalities, as well as the, uh, the idea that five families in the UK have the same combined wealth as the poorest 12 million people. We're now told by Oxfam that three families in Scotland have the same wealth as the poorest 20% of people. And that's in a country which is the 14th richest in the world. That's a level of inequality which is not only morally wrong, but stops us from achieving our economic ambitions. So if we're to tackle these inequalities, uh, we have power to be balanced much more between the individual, between communities and professionals. And people have to be seen as citizens, neighbours and co-producers of services. The third sector, with its connections and its reach to community networks and organisations and its capacity to mobilise volunteers and external investment, is a critical partner in working directly with individuals, families and communities to co-produce approaches which build on the assets found in every community across Scotland and support resilience and well-being. And the way of working, uh, in that way uh, of working, we can enable greater levels of participation in the democratic process. And that also helps to unlock the potential found in every community. That is the distinctive Scottish approach to public service design and delivery. And it's key to tackling inequalities and delivering the better outcomes we all seek. Uh, in conclusion, uh, Presiding Officer, I've mentioned asymmetric uh, austerity. If it was the case that everyone faced the cuts that we faced equally uh, and that they together shared the pain and the grief, I'm not saying it would be right. We have a fundamental difference with the approach that's been taken, but it would be easier to accept. But that's not the case. We have, uh, in our view, need to, we have a need to have a strategic approach to service renewal that's been internationally recognised with a Carnegie Trust review of international evidence identifying Scotland as unique in supporting its system-wide rethink of public services with coherent cross-cutting programmes of improvement. Uh, and we're in a good position, we're in as good a position as it can be with the limitations that we have to get into that particular uh, service renewal framework, given that we are dealing with policies that are not of our making. As I've said, Scotland is the 14th richest country in the world, and yet one million people in Scotland are in poverty, including 220,000 children, of which half uh, live in a household where at least one adult works. Uh, let's be clear, continuing cuts are going to be extremely severe. Uh, a figure of £15 billion has been mentioned. And so it's more important than ever that we have an alternative approach. And there is an austerity alternative, one which would support up to 30,000 jobs. Uh, the Scottish Government, for our part, would seek to invest £1.2 million of additional resources in 2017-18 and £2.4 billion more in additional resources in 2018-19 to invest in Scotland's economy, as outlined in the Outlook for Scotland's Public Finance. Report. It would be great to add to that the savings that we could make if we were to abolish Trident, something which Neil Finlay failed to support uh, previously in this Parliament. Uh, but that would produce in excess of £200 million more every year for the lifetime of that uh, uh, expenditure on those weapons.
The economic uh, impact of that spend would depend on the specific programmes allocated uh, to us. But based on the output input tables, it's estimated that £2.4 billion increase in spending if it was distributed across public services, capital investment and so social transfers uh, in proportion to their share of current Scottish public spending could boost GVA by approximately £1.5 billion and support up to 30,000 jobs uh, a year. Uh, Presiding officer, we have a clear choice. Stick with the Westminster Party's consensus on cuts or invest in Scotland's public services to support economic growth, create jobs and tackle inequality. Thanks very much. I now call on Mary Fee to speak to and move Amendment 12034.2. Uh, quite tight for time today, up to 10 minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I am pleased to be opening today's very important debate on protecting public services on behalf of Scottish Labour. Our public services care, protect and educate us and the world-class workforce that endure long, tiring hours and environments that we cannot begin to imagine in some circumstances deserve our respect, encouragement and both our moral and financial support. The Scottish Government in motion once again lays the blame at Westminster without taking any responsibility for their own actions. Our amendment, whilst recognising the difficult financial circumstances, acknowledges the pooling and sharing of resources across the UK and highlights the benefit that the Barnet formula brings. Local government finance is broken, our NHS is at breaking point with a and E's in crisis and our education system from childcare to college needs leadership and prioritisation. Instead, we have the SNP withholding crucial funds from Scottish councils, the NHS and our children's future. I'll happily take an intervention from the member if he could explain to me why this government is sitting with a £440 million underspend when our NHS is in crisis. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, well, of course, the member knows perfectly well that we are not. But more fundamentally, the member's uh, amendment deletes from the government motion the expenditure in relation to Trident. Does that mean she is in favour of investing huge sums of money in Trident instead of for the benefit of the people of Scotland and elsewhere in the UK? Presiding officer, as I suspected, I would get no answer from the member. And it is disappointing. It is disappointing that the government... It is disappointing that the government benches would rather pay, play political ping-pong than debate this very important issue. £440 million is no drop in the ocean for public services in the current climate. No, I'm sorry, I need to make some progress. Even if the figure represents... Members not giving point, way. Even if the figure represents 1.3 of the overall budget, the budget underspend includes £165 million from the school's budget. On top of this, we have one of Scotland's main industries struggling with jobs at risk, <coughs> incomes reducing and families worried. I briefly mentioned schools, hospitals and councils, and that's what I wish to focus on. If you'll let me make some progress, I'll, I'll come back to you, Mr Swinney, on opening for Scottish Labour. Presiding officer, teacher numbers are at a 10-year low. Over 4,000 teachers have been removed from Scottish classrooms at a time when pupil numbers are rising. This has led to larger... No, I need to make some progress, I'm sorry. This has led to larger classroom sizes and a failure by the SNP to keep their promise on this matter. Parents and pupils deserve and want better than this. And the Scottish Government respond by holding back money from the education budget. The percentage of pupils in classes of 18 or less has fallen from 21.6% in 2010 to just 12.9% last year. This distressing statistic shows that the SNP have no plan to protect public services and teachers know this Scottish Government can't be trusted yeah. to assist the education of young children. Children in the most deprived areas are struggling in comparison to those in the most affluent areas and the attainment gap is su substantial, especially for looked after children. Scottish Labour supports the role that further education can play in our communities and growing our economy. This is one of our most precious public services that offers a lifeline to many across Scotland. The opportunity for an education should be available to all no matter the background of the prospective student. 
Vocational courses enhance the employability of our workforce and the unemployed alike and are intrinsic to boosting our economy. Colleges have been attack, under attack from this government. Student numbers have sharply decreased, learning hours cut by 10 million and the further education budget squeezed and cut by tens of millions in real terms. So when the SNP talk about securing economic growth in their motion, they need to reassess their stance on college education and reverse their previous cuts. This would be a great opportunity for the new Education Secretary to re-establish the trust in our college system and place faith in the hard-working lecturers that remain in their jobs. Presiding officer, this year's general election will be unlike any seen on these islands. However, the choice for Scots couldn't be clearer. Do they want a Labour government that is committed to investing in the NHS or more of the same attacks on the UK's most sacred institution? I, for one, look forward to Prime Minister Ed Miliband implementing, <laughs> implementing <laughs> Labour's Time to Care Fund, which will see an additional £250 million added to the Scottish budget through the Barnet formula. The mansion tax, the tax on tobacco companies and clamping down on tax avoidance schemes will raise around £2.5 billion and Scottish Labour have rightly pledged to use part of the resulting boost to our budget to fund an additional 1,000 nurses. Again, the choice could not be clearer. A Labour government that will create and use the resources available for the NHS or the Tories or the SNP. Going back to the referendum campaign, we constantly heard how the Scottish Government was underfunded and the NHS would be privatised in the event of a no vote. As we knew at the time and clarified again in the last week, the only crisis put on the NHS is one of this Government's making. Accident and emergencies are close to breaking and as Scottish Labour showed at the weekend, Waiting times are not being met for 12,510 patients since 2012. There were 12,510 occasions where patients have not received their legal right to be treated within 12 weeks. How many of these patients could have had their legal right met with additional allocations from the budgetary underspend? How many nurses, doctors and other crucial hospital staff would the budget underspend have paid for? These are serious questions which patients and their families deserve to. For the Scottish Government to use the NHS as a primary example of how they protect public service is nothing but a slap in the face to the 12,510 patients denied the legal right they themselves implemented. They giveth and they taketh away. No, this is far too important a debate to play political ping pong. My colleagues... Order. My colleagues... My colleagues on these benches will pick up on matters relating to the NHS throughout this debate, and our focus will remain the same. Patients deserve better. Presiding officer, an ageing and growing population, increasing operational co costs. I suppose it's, it's an example, presiding officer, of the attitude of this government towards our public services, that they would rather sneer and jeer than listen. Absolutely. Presiding officer, an ageing and growing population, increasing Order. operational costs and heavily centralised commitments, such as the underfunded council tax freeze, are placing an unbearable burden on local authorities who are screaming out for financial assistance. The pressure forced on councils are... No, I'm, I'm not taking any interventions. The pressure forced on councils are resulting... Allow the member to be ...in heard, increasingly please. difficult decisions which are disproportionately impacting on the poorest in our society. Under the SNP, Local government has taken the largest share of budget cuts and the jo Joseph Rowntree Foundation warns us that local government spending is set to fall by 24% in real terms this year. Every single local authority has faced real term cuts between 2007 and now. The Scottish Government talk about protecting public services and that smacks of total desperation 
and shows how hypocritical this SNP government are, because the real term cuts are against a backdrop of increased costs of 10 per cent since 2007, and councils are resorting to increasing the charges for services. The Scottish Government controls 82 per cent of our local authority budgets, and they have simply passed the Tory cuts down to our councils. In her speech to the SNP's October conference, Nicola Sturgeon, the First Minister, said she knows there are Westminster MPs in all UK parties itching to abolish Barnet. The only party itching to abolish Barnet are the SNP, and their plan for full fiscal autonomy would devastate our, our public services. In the post, last please. week, Jackie Bailey rightly stated that there is no greater danger to our economy right now than the falling price of oil, because we rely on the revenues from the oil industry to run our public services. An oil price of $50 a barrel means an 85 per cent cut in the revenues from what the Scottish Government predicted in its own white paper, yet the Government still continue to base their economic estimates on a higher price. You must draw to a close, please. Presiding officer, our schools, our NHS, our councils, our justice system and communities are not safe in the hands of the SNP. Public service workers are the backbone that ensures we are cared for, educated and kept safe. And I and move finally, the amendment in my name. Many thanks. I now call on Gavin Brown to speak to and move amendment 12034.3. Up to six minutes, please, Mr Brown. Presiding officer, thank you. Can I start by uh, moving the amendment in my name and uh, also by saying publicly, I think, because it's the first time I've had the chance to do so, to con congratulate Keith Brown on his promotion to Cabinet and indeed uh, Mary Fee on her promotion uh, to Labour's uh, top team. Um, presenting officer, the government motion started well. Uh, a couple of lines into it, we were perfectly happily with it, but uh, very quickly it turned into the rather predictable, hackneyed, uh, complaint blaming everybody else uh, for issues other than themselves and ending up with that age-old issue of saying there is an alternative to an austerity agenda. Um, the fact is that the Scottish Government claims there is an alternative, but they just won't say what it is. I've lost track of the number of times we've asked them in this chamber what is their alternative and, more crucially, how would that be funded? It's all well and good for Keith Brown to stand up in this chamber and to glibly quote from a pre-referendum document that was designed purely to attract votes, entitled The Outlook for Scotland's Finances, and rather nonchalantly say we could just spend a couple of extra billion in 1516, a few billion more in 1617, and a few billion more in 1718, and everything will be all right. But what nobody in the Scottish Government has done at any point is explain where those extra billions were to come from. If it were as easy as putting it in a document and making it happen, I suspect every political party would be saying it, and I suspect everybody would want us to do it. But ultimately, in, in one second I will, of course I will, if you are going to do that, you have to either increase borrowing, you have to cut spending somewhere else, or you have to increase taxation. And I think we have a right to know which one of those it would be. Keith Brown. Just as one example, apart from the ones which I mentioned when I spoke earlier, how about the housing benefit overspend just now, around £8 billion, I think £1.2 billion a year uh, spent in overpayments um, and also in relation to fraud, which has grown over recent years. Surely, if his government got a grip of that, we could have more money for public spending in Scotland. Gavin Brown. I think so. So he's wanting to, to cut the housing benefit budget in some way in order to pay for it. I haven't seen that on any SNP manifesto, but every government... Every government, I have to say, including the Scottish Government, does all it can to cut down on fraud. And I know the, uh, John Swinney's put a lot of effort into that to making sure that's the case with the land and buildings transaction tax and indeed the landfill tax. Every government attempts to do that, but I think most governments accept that you cannot eliminate it uh, in its entirety. So I didn't think those figures, I didn't think those figures were credible at the time, Deputy Presiding Officer. And that was at a point in history where oil was trading at $110 a barrel. So the figures didn't really work then. When it dropped to $80 a barrel, they became even less credible, 70 down to 60, down to 50, now heading towards 45. It's fantasy. That document, the outlook for Scotland's finances, is a historic document. I believed it was fantasy at the time, but events subsequent to that 
I think, have proven that it is genuine fantasy now. So they can say there's an alternative, but until they outline what that alternative is, it completely lacks any degree of credibility. Now, Mr Swinney looked like he was about to stand up in that case. I'll give way to, to Mark Macdonald in that case. Mark Macdonald. I'm, I'm grateful to the member for giving way. Can the member advise what the figure is for uncollected revenue through unpaid taxation, which of course would be money that would be available to the Exchequer to spend on essential services? Kevin Brown. I think, as the member knows, if he's paid attention to the last five budgets and indeed autumn statements, the amount of resources being put into the inland revenue to cut down on tax evasion to ensure that we collect the maximum possible amount has improved. And I think the results have been encouraging and people giving evidence to the Finance Committee have made that specific point. So I think the UK Government will have its critics, but to suggest they haven't been trying to ensure the maximum tax take, I have to say, I think lacks a degree of credibility. But let me move on to the point I wanted to make uh, to Keith Brown in my intervention. Because the Scottish Government needs to start talking about the powers that it has and taking action where it can take action. Everyone in this chamber agreed that preventative spending was one of the most important things we could do as a parliament three years ago at the spending review process. The Scottish Government at the time put forward £500 million through three change funds over a three-year period in order to get what they described as a decisive shift a step change that would improve outcomes and would get far better results for people across Scotland. How are we doing after three years? Well, the Finance Committee rather helpfully produced its report yesterday, and I have to say it's a pretty damaging critique of almost everything this government has done in preventative spend over the last three years. We quote Audit Scotland, who say it's unlikely to deliver radical change in the design and delivery of public services. The Local Government and uh, Regeneration Committee's view is that pace of transformation of service delivery across the public services in Scotland Members is in last concerning. Minute, the, Finance Committee, the Finance Committee, without anyone disagreeing, said there is little evidence of the essential shift in resource taking place to support a preventative. So I'm happy to give way if, if there no. is... Uh, you're not. You're in your last well, minute. Uh, my, my apologies to the Cabinet Secretary. I was, I was certainly willing to do so. In relation, in, relation, in, 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 relation to the, uh, in relation to the Children and Young People's Fund, the committee remains concerned, without anyone disagreeing across the parties, that despite an investment, little evidence has been provided of any clothes, shift please. in the funding models. Presiding officer, this is a serious issue. It's £500 million, and it's something the Scottish Government, if it is concerned about public services, should be looking at with a fine-tooth comb to make sure that we get it right. Many thanks. Now, call on Liam MacArthur. Up to six minutes. Thank you, Deputy President. Officer, like Gavin Brown, can I belatedly uh, congratulate Keith Brown on his uh, promotion and also welcome the uh, Labour front bench uh, to their positions. I also welcome the opportunity to participate in this debate and, and put on record the gratitude and respect of myself and the Scottish Liberal Democrats for the vital contribution made by all those who work across our public sector in Scotland. I need no persuading at all that making that contribution has been more difficult over recent times in the face of the need to bring the country's finances back under control and tackle the legacy of debt. This has presented enormous challenges and continues to create real pressures, not least for those working to deliver our public services. Yet meeting those challenges is made no easier by the SNP's government's obsession with independence, an obsession that leads them to characterise support for Scotland remaining a part of the UK as somehow uh, anti-public service. Again today we have heard it implied that an independent Scotland would miraculously be immune from the need to rein in public spending, this despite the government's own fiscal commission advising that matching the UK's definite, uh, deficit reduction path uh, would be required. Since then we have seen world oil prices fall to half the level they were at when the government's uh, white paper was published, leaving an even bigger black hole at the heart of the SNP's assertions that would almost inevitably uh, require deeper cuts in public services. The other tragedy of the SNP's self-delusion, where everything difficult is always somebody else's fault, is that it ignores the reality of what is happening now within our public services and removes the responsibility of doing anything to help improve the situation. So what has been happening on the SNP's watch? Well, the RCN recently reported that staff at NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde have been expressing concerns that they have too few staff and too little equipment 
to look after patients properly. NHS Grampian 2 has been in crisis due to a lack of funding, a situation that ministers belatedly woke up to earlier this week, having taken their eye off the ball for years. The damage caused by this inaction is very real. It has affected staff, patients and the wider community in the North East, as well as the islands I represent, where constituents rely heavily on specialist services and treatment provided by NHS Grampian. I'll give way to Kevin Stewart. Kevin Stewart. Um, I thank the member for giving way. Uh, would uh, Mr MacArthur care to comment uh, on the Arbuthnot formula which was in place for many years, uh, which led to that underfunding of NHS Grampian? And would he pay tribute to the likes of the late Brian Adam, who had that system abolished, which the Labour Liberal Coalition wouldn't, in favour of NRAC? And uh, would he welcome the position that was announced yesterday? It, it's, it's funny how there's been a, 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 a revelation um, for the SNP with a, a general election impending. I've been told for years about this underfunding for NHS Grampian, having witnessed the crisis that's unfolded. In our schools too, we're seeing teachers put under enormous Order. strain. No one could argue that the rollout last year of the new exams under the Curriculum for Excellence was textbook. EIS repeatedly warned of the effect that additional workload and uncertainty was having on teachers as well as pupils and their parents. Meanwhile, last week, also saw confirmation that the government has again failed to honour its commitments on primary school uh, class sizes and teacher numbers, both failures that make life much more difficult for those working in this key public sector and those who rely on it. Education and health are both areas where the Scottish Government already has a full range of powers over policy and budgets. SNP ministers cannot duck the consequences of the decisions they have chosen to make. They may wish to say that a big boy did it and ran away, but blaming Mr Salmond does not absolve them of the responsibility to face up to the choices any and every government has to make. Boasting about the continued freeze on council tax, for example, is perfectly legitimate, but only if at the same time you accept the effect that this has on the ability of local councils to meet the demands placed upon them for a wide range of services. Only if you acknowledge that a measure which everybody knows benefits most those living in largest houses, asymmetric benefits, if you will, means there is less money available for other priorities, including those targeted at those most in need. The other nonsense trotted out by the SNP Deputy Presiding Officer is that they have no truck with the private sector helping to deliver public services. For sound, pragmatic reasons, this has never been the case, despite protestations over the last eight years. In that time, Ministers have been happy for Kilmarnock Prison to be run by a private operator, so happy, in fact, that they subsequently offered the same private operator, Serco, a contract to run lifeline ferry services to Orkney and Shetland. Our health services, too, have long involved private operators as partners, carrying out specific operations and treatment, as well as helping meet government targets, for example, in relation to dental provision. The truth is, the SNP has presided over annual increases in the amount of public money that is spent on private providers in the health service to the tune now of over £400 million. Meanwhile, for all the talk today and in this motion about the UK government's austerity agenda, the fact remains that Barnet consequentials from protected health and education spending have allowed the Scottish Government, if it wishes, to plough those increases into key public services in Scotland. A further £238 million will come to Scotland, courtesy of the autumn statement. Add to that the significant underspend Mr Swinney has admitted in running up. And the assertions from the SNP are even more nonsensical. Moreover, the economic course taken by the coalition has put the UK's finances back on track. Liberal Democrats have anchored the economic policy in the centre ground. It is that security for the future from which As we you can build quality clothes, public services which are affordable and sustainable into the long term. Contrast that with the prospectus offered by the nationalists who still appear intent on pursuing independence by the back door. Presiding officer, the SNP took his eye off the ball in pursuit of independence, an obsession that remains for many young. So we will not take lectures on public services, services which in Scotland the Liberal Democrats have helped to protect by balancing spending and borrowing to allow continued movement close, from economic please. rescue to recovery. This is the best and most robust foundation on which to build a strong economy and a fairer society, able to deliver high quality public services and opportunity for all. And on that basis, I have pleasure in moving the amendment in my name. Many thanks. And we now call on Kevin Stewart as we move to the open debate to be followed by Ian Gray. Up to six minutes, please. Tight for time. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I think we should uh, take a step back uh, and look at the realities of what uh, is going on uh, at this moment in time. Uh, and let's quote uh, some of the bodies that the 
Tory uh, Liberal coalition uh, often uh, uh, speak about uh, in this chamber. Uh, the IFS have described the plan cuts uh, as spending cuts on a colossal scale, taking total government spending to its lowest level as a proportion of national income since before the last war. The OBR note that under the coalition government's plans, total public spending would fall to 35.2% of GDP by 2019-20 and would probably be the lowest in around 80 years. Back to the 1930s, folks, basically. Uh, and economist James Meadway says, on the fund fundamental issue of austerity, there is remarkably little to choose between Conservative and Labour. These are the realities. And it is likely today that Labour will enter the lobbies uh, with the Tories at Westminster to support £30 billion worth of austerity cuts. That may be the Westminster way, but that is not the way that I want to follow. And it's, I don't think it's the way that the people of Scotland want to follow either. And at the same time as we are seeing uh, cuts to public services, which amount to about £1,800 per head of population, we see this continued nonsense of wanting to replace uh, a current weapon of mass destruction system uh, with another one. Uh, and one of the things which amazes me about that situation is, again, there is very little between Tory, Labour and Liberal uh, on that front. They all seem happy to throw tens of billions of pounds at such abhorrent weapons, which hopefully would never be used, uh, and seem perfectly uh, at ease uh, that uh, these cuts uh, will fall on the poorest in society to pay for these weapons of mass destruction. When he was Shadow Defence Secretary, the current Scottish Labour leader, Jim Murphy, told B BBC Radio Scotland's GMS programme, we're in favour of the UK retaining a nuclear capability. He also said that Labour's anti-nuclear stance in the 1980s was a flirtation with surrealism. Well, I'll tell you what I think is a flirtation of surrealism. Spending money on weapons of mass destruction and at the same time cutting public services and having a major effect uh, on the poorest in our society. That is a flirtation with surrealism uh, as far as I'm concerned and that is something that I want to see uh, change dramatically. Uh, we have heard um, all of the nonsenses round about the, uh, this SNP government uh, and what it has been doing. Well, of course, this SNP government has to cut its cloth to the money that we actually get. That money, of course, comes from the Treasury. And we have seen cut after cut after cut. And yet, at the same time, um, we have seen, uh, as far as I'm concerned, clever ways of dealing with the situation, ensuring that public services are protected to its utmost, and uh, um, as far as I'm concerned, the people of Scotland recognise that protection of services uh, like the NHS is something that the SNP government has done uh, particularly well. And Mr. Um, uh, uh, gosh, I've forgotten your name. Uh, uh, the representative from Orkney, Mr. MacArthur, um, ha ha has... Has, has in his speech, uh, it, it was easily forgotten, Mr. MacArthur, because it was the usual nonsense, uh, fails to take account of the years uh, that his party were in power in this place, who had a, a, a dud formula, the Arbuthnot formula, which dealt with NHS spending. Uh, it was something that my colleague Brian Adam campaigned long and hard against, and it was this government that eventually got rid of our Arbuthnot and replaced it with a fairer former formula uh, in the form of NRAC. And largely do, do, down to lobbying from the likes of Brian Adam and other colleagues, we've seen that happen. And beyond that, uh, what we have seen is a move to create parity uh, quicker uh, from this government. And I thank um, the... Members I'm in my last minute. minute. I thank... 
um, the Cabinet Secretary uh, for Health for the announcement yesterday, which will see £15.2 million extra coming to NHS Grampian. An uplift next year in NHS Grampian's budget of £49.1 million. Uh, the share uh, of the NHS Roger, budget close, to Grampian has risen from 9.1% when this government came to power to 9.7% today. Staffing levels have increased by 4.4% and there are 29.6% more medical consultants uh, in NHS Grampian there were, than there were when this government took power. That is good news Closing. as far as I'm concerned. I will continue to lobby for the North East, as ministers will well know. Uh, but what we've got to look at is what this government has managed to achieve despite Westminster cuts. Many thanks. Thank you. Now call on Ian Gray to be followed by John McAlpine. Up to six minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer. In debating the protection of public services, uh, we always inevitably end up confronting the question of uh, what is most important to us. Uh, and for the Labour Party, Nye Bevan's dictum that the language of priorities is the religion of socialism is never far from our minds, nor indeed is the Labour Party's proudest achievement, the creation of the NHS, the legacy of that same Nye Bevan's politics and his own priorities, and colleagues uh, will have plenty to say about the NHS. But we are Scottish too, and thus mindful of what is perhaps Scotland as a nation's greatest public sector legacy, and that is our education system. Our oldest university recently celebrated its 600th anniversary, and next year it will be 400 years since the School Establishment Act, the foundation of the system of a school in every parish, the idea of universal education which underpins our education system uh, to this day. And indeed, the, the government motion calls public services the bedrock of a fair and prosperous society, uh, and no more so uh, than education. Uh, in the, the aftermath of uh, uh, what happened in France and the debate currently around uh, liberty and rights and uh, how they play against security, it's worth remembering that Lincoln's colleague, Edward Everett, said, education is a better safeguard of liberty than a standing army. So an idea worth protecting and up there with the health service as a public sector priority. The government motion is explicit in identifying education as one of the key services we must protect. But the motion also portrays that Scottish government as a protector of public services. And indeed, the cabinet secretary waxed lyrical in such self-praise in his opening remarks. So we are entitled to ask uh, what priorities this government has given to education and to what extent they have met the standards they set for themselves. They, sure. MacDonald. On the subject of priorities, this afternoon the Labour Party will march through the lobby with the Tories, not just to back the Tory budget, but to lock the UK into austerity for many years to come. What does that say about Labour's priority for public spending and what does it say to the people of Scotland about the messages the Labour Party is sending to them? Ian Gray. Well, uh, uh, our priorities are to protect the public services, stable finances, and allocating them in the place uh, which is most important to our political priorities. That's the point Nye Bevan was making back in the 50s, and it's the point all serious politicians uh, have to make today. And it requires a degree of honesty, and we can ask ourselves if that degree of honesty has been forthcoming from the Scottish Government, because the Scottish, this is the Scottish Government who promised Scottish parents that they would maintain teacher numbers at the levels they inherited in 2007 so that class sizes would decline. And in 2011, they promised to continue, they said, with reductions in class sizes and to improve pupil-teacher ratios. And the truth is that we now have over 4,000 fewer teachers in our schools than there were in 2007, and pupil-teacher ratios are higher than they were eight years ago and rising. Classroom assistants have been cut, additional support provision has been cut, preschool teachers have been cut, numeracy levels are falling, and the attainment gap between children from poorer families and the better off remains persistent and significant. Just before Christmas, briefly. I thank, the member, for, I thank the member for taking uh, 
uh, the intervention. I'm listening to what he says, and I wonder whether he could explain why, given what he said, that when COSLA gave evidence to the Education Committee on the budget this year, they said the budget looks OK for next year. Um, they didn't ask for any more money. And as I understand it, COSLA is dominated by Labour councils. And would you also like to comment on the fact that only two councils actually right, gave evidence uh, on the, bu the budget cuts? Ian Gray. On the budget. Look, I don't mind giving an intervention, but uh, you know this is a speech, and then people complain when we don't take uh, interventions. Whatever COSLA might have said, I can tell the member what the EIS said. The EIS are in absolutely no doubt that just before Christmas, in presenting his budget, the Deputy First Minister abandoned uh, his commitments on teacher numbers and class sizes when he replaced them uh, with broader educational outcomes. Now, there may be nothing wrong with the idea of broader educational outcomes. I agreed with teachers and parents. That's what uh, Mr. Swinney said he was going to pursue. My question is this. After eight years, three education secretaries and two first ministers do you not think that someone would have got round to working out what our educational outcomes for schools are before now? We want our schools to be the best in the world and we want to see the attainment gap which leaves too many pupils behind addressed at last. And that will not happen until our schools are given real and not just rhetorical protection. And the truth is, and the truth is, the schools have probably suffered less than colleges. 2012-13 saw FE budget slashed. This year's budget maintains the financial squeeze. 1,500 you posts have gone post, from please. our colleges and 140,000 fewer students are able to study in them. It is hard then to see where the protection of schools, is, uh, schools and colleges has been and harder still when we find out in the latest outturn figures £165 million pound underspend Must in the close, education please. budget. Yes, we need to protect public services like education from Tory plans, but we also need to protect them from this Scottish Government, their false promises, their wrong priorities and their empty rhetoric. Thank you very much. Now call on Joan McAlpine to be followed by Neil Finlay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to speak in this debate for a number of reasons, not least because it illustrates what we have called a tale of two governments. We see the government in London slash and burn public services they wish to conquer and destroy the welfare state, the NHS, and the entire commitment to collective good that we've all grown up with. Uh, like their mentor, Margaret Thatcher, they're ideologically opposed to the principle of public service, and the recent proposal to remove the right to strike from public service workers demonstrates that contempt for all kinds of collective action. Although if they get their way, there will be no public sector workers left at all. As has already been mentioned, the Office of Budget Responsibility that the Coalition Government themselves set up predicts that total public spending will fall to 35.2% of GDP by 2019-20, which is probably the lowest in around 80 years, according to the OBR. They pursue this social vandalism known as austerity, even though the facts show it has failed. By the end of 2015, the UK economy is forecast to be almost 4% smaller than was predicted in 2010 when the Chancellor first entered office. By contrast, the Government in Scotland has maintained superior public services in the most difficult of circumstances. Between 2010-11 and 2015-16, the discretionary budget of the Scottish Government has been cut in real terms by around 10%, and independent analysis suggests this could reach almost 20% by 2018-19. And of course, cuts to UK spending have a further knock-on effect on Scotland's devolved budget if we try to mitigate the effects of policies such as welfare cuts. Yes, I will. Great. The British government has protected public services to a greater degree than the UK government and the rest of the UK. Can she explain uh, why in Scotland we are investing almost half as much in science education in our schools than in the rest of the UK? How does that happen? John McAlpine. I think the record of Scotland's schools speaks for, for itself. And um, on the subject of education, on the subject of education, the fact that we have delivered free education when school, uh, students in uh, England and Wales are having to pay £9,000 a year in tuition fees and younger students are being deprived of the EMA, which is, is put in place, shows how far ahead we are in terms of provision to, and commitment to public services. As I was... I was 
talking about the further knock-on effect on Scotland's devolved budget if we try to mitigate the policy, uh, policies such as welfare cuts, which we must for decency's sake, offsetting the bedroom tax, establishing a Scottish welfare fund, topping up council tax benefits, all are essential and all take money out of public service budgets. But Westminster's mess must be cleared up. But there is a cost, and this year that cost is 104 million. And there's worse to come with the OBR forecast that 60% of the UK government's cuts have still to take effect. Given this background, it's nothing short of a miracle that Scotland's public services still perform well. The health resource budget, for example, has grown by 4.6% in real terms, despite the overall 10% cut in Scotland's resource budget. I've already mentioned the free tuition, which we're... Yeah? Brown. Has the health budget grown by more in England or in Scotland? McAlpine. Scotland's spending per head is far ahead, on health is far greater, um, far greater than in England, as he well knows. And the health resource budget in Scotland has grown, as I was saying, by 4.6 in real terms, uh, despite the overall 10% cut to Scotland's resource budget inflicted by his government colleagues in London. In criminal justice, we have delivered an extra 1,000 uh, officers, while numbers in England and Wales will drop by more than 15,000. And the coming year will support the provision of 600 hours of childcare to over 120,000 three and four year olds and eligible two year olds. And of course, the rollout of free school meals shows that the commitment to universalism and the social wage remains despite the mounting pressures being placed on us. But what is perhaps most remarkable about this tale of two governments is that despite all these pressures, the Scottish Government continues to look ahead and to develop enhanced public services fit for the 21st century, even if the UK want to roll them back to the first half of the 20th century. In health, for example, we should all welcome the commitment to the 2020 vision for health and social care, enshrining the prevention agenda set out in the Christie Commission. Under the Public Bodies Joint Working Scotland Act, which comes into force in April this year, new partnerships between the NHS and local authorities will have the responsibility for planning and delivering health and social services in their areas. This will meet the needs of vulnerable people in their community and take pressure off our NHS. And I welcome the additional 100 million allocated to aid integration in 2015-16. Also in health, further important preventative work is being funded and taken forward, for example, in the Detect Cancer Early programme. In the draft budget, I was very pleased to see proposals that this line increase in cash terms from 8.5 million in 2014-15 to 9.3 million in 2015-16. To draw to a close, please. I should perhaps have said that I started talking about a tale of two governments. But perhaps I should have talked about a tale of two parliaments, because it appears that whichever unionist party holds power on the banks of the Thames, the outcomes will be equally dismal. Uh, in December, Ed Balls and Ed Miliband both promised uh, to, to meet the Tory cuts. In fact, uh, last week it seemed as if they were vying with the Tories to show that they would be tougher on public services. And, all the, while, close, and all the while promising to equal Tory spending and renew Trident at a cross of £100 billion, which will, of course, uh, detract from That's huge excellent. swathes Many of thanks. public services now in call the UK. On Neil Finlay to be followed by Mark MacDonald. Thanks, President Officer. Uh, the UK uh, coalition government is involved in an ideologically driven attack on the very services that civilise our society. The services that mean that irrespective of your wealth, we all get our bins emptied, our children receive an education and our elderly are looked after and we access a whole host of other services. We see Cameron and Clegg and Osborne driving further privatisation, closing libraries, youth services, sport and leisure facilities, housing budgets slashed and social care in crisis. To them, these are either services that they don't want and can flog off to their city friends or that they don't use. Therefore, to them, there's no value in them. And so they must be surplus to requirements. That's the attitude of the coalition. And for the sake of those people who rely on those services, then let's hope they're booted out of government in May and replaced by a Labour government. But yes, certainly. Keith Brown. Uh, can I thank Neil Finlay for taking the intervention and whether uh, he would agree with me that, uh, as he just said, that privatisation of those public services is a bad thing, or does he agree with uh, the Labour leader in Scotland's right-hand man, uh, John McTernan, when he says privatisation is good for the NHS? 
I will Real listen to the Labour leader in Scotland. Thanks very much. Um, President officer, uh, the, it's not just in England that we see cuts to services. Far from it. I often some, uh, wonder what planet uh, SNP backbenchers live on. Here in Scotland, local government is at breaking point and the NHS is under strain like never before in its history. Council services are no longer being cut. Some services are disappearing altogether. Yet today we see the Minister come to this chamber with all the gall and brass neck that we associate with this government, putting down a motion paying tribute to those who teach, treat, protect and serve our communities. Yet there is no recognition, no self-awareness, not even a mention of any of the policies being pursued by this Scottish Government, policies that are impacting so badly on our people and our communities. And I want to know exactly who the Minister is paying tribute to in his motion. Is he paying tribute to the classroom assistants that I work beside in his constituency, some of whom were like mothers to the vulnerable children in some of my classes, but who have now lost their jobs? Is he paying tribute to the community wardens who keep our streets clean and safe, but who have been paid off? Is he paying tribute to the social care staff who work for private contractors who demand 15-minute care visits, some working for as little as £5.13 an hour on a zero-hour contract? Is he paying tribute to them? Is he paying tribute to the police support staff, thousands of whom his government have got rid of? Is he paying tribute to the ambulance staff who still can't get proper breaks? Or the fire control room staff whose jobs have been centralised and cut? And the thousands of college lecturers and support staff who've gone following Mike Russell's disastrous spell in charge of our colleges? Or maybe he's paying tribute to the 40,000 council staff who've lost their jobs across a whole range of sectors? Or is he paying tribute to the public sector workers who he says we are protecting so well, who will be on strike in this very building next Thursday because of John Swinney's pay policy. Are these the people that he's paying tribute to? I'm sick to the back teeth of the hypocrisy, no thanks to the hypocrisy of this government. Here in this government, at times of bad weather, following an emergency or an accident, praising public sector workers for their efforts and commitment in one breath, then in the next passing budgets, that mean more of this, those very same workers will lose their jobs, have their pay reduced or frozen, or our services cut. President officer, the government claim the council tax freeze, no thanks, has been fully funded each year of their term in office. This is an out and out lie. Look at my own council. From 2003 to 2011, I was a proud member of West Lothian Council. In 2006, we won UK Council of the Year because, because we ran well run, efficient, uh, we were a well-run, efficient council providing good quality, valued pu public services. It is still a well-run council today. Yet despite claims to have fully funded the council tax freeze, West Lothian Council has been forced since 2007 to cut its budget by £58 million and will need to cut by another £30 million over the next three years. Eye-watering cuts, even greater than those passed on by Osborne and Eric Pickles to local government in England. As John Stevenson of Unison put it a few days ago, 40,000 jobs have been lost across Scottish councils. If that had been any other employer, politicians would have been queuing up to demand action and a rescue plan, and he is absolutely right. Rather than engage in such rank hypocrisy, the minister should be apologising for his actions, the actions of his government, the actions that have slashed our services while sitting on a £444 million pound underspend. What hypocrisy, presiding officer. Let me say this. No thanks. Presiding officer, we can't go on like this. It is immoral what the government are telling public sector workers. We need to fund our services. We need the mansion tax, the bankers bonus tax. We need the 50 pence tax rate. And we need our local government services to be fully funded. We need a Labour government. Thank you very much. Now Colin Mark Macdonald to be followed by Christina McKelvey. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Being lectured by hypocrisy, uh, on hypocrisy by Neil Findlay, I, I, like uh, Alice in Wonderland, Presiding Officer, I try and believe six impossible things before breakfast, but one of those was not that Neil Findlay would be capable of making such a speech on the very day that his party will march through the lobby with the Tories at Westminster and condemn the UK to further austerity, whatever the colour of Tory government is elected in May. That's why it's so crucial that the Labour government, if there is to be one, is not a majority Labour government, but one that has a, uh, an SNP conscience 
attached to it to try and ensure that the public sector and public services of Scotland are protected. Indeed, today in Parliament we see the real progressives in Parliament. The SNP, Plaid Cymru and the Greens are the ones opposing the Tories while the Labour Party backs them up. So we'll take no lectures on hypocrisy from those Labour members who talk left in this chamber but vote right in Westminster. And what I say, presiding officer, is that yes, there is an opportunity here for us to look at how we protect public services. One, uh, maybe a little bit later, Mr McIntosh. And it is equally galling for the Labour Party to come here and throw around an underspend that they know full well that they know full well is allocated against financial transactions and managed expenditure and therefore cannot be used in the ways that they suggest, save for the £145 million which Mr Swinney himself announced in the chamber in June and stated he would carry forward and use in the financial year <coughs> in order to fund, for example, uh, welfare uh, mitigation measures and economic uh, support. So we have already seen Mr Swinney taking action in relation to the underspend that he is able to carry forward and able to utilise. And it is equally uh, on the issue of being lectured on hypocrisy by the Labour Party galling to see them uh, make these comments when, when the SNP inherited office in 2007, we had to negotiate furiously with the Treasury in order to secure £1 billion, £1 billion of Scottish expenditure that was left sitting in a Treasury bank account by the previous Labour Lib Dem executive and could potentially have been lost to Scotland's public services because of their inability to manage their budgets appropriately. We will take no lectures. We will certainly take no lectures from Jackie Bailey on these issues. And I had previous, no, I'd previous I previously said to Mr McIntosh, if he wanted to come in later, I would take him in later. So uh, I will use the rest of my time, meantime, to move on and talk about other issues. The Labour Party lecture us on the issue of teacher numbers as well. Uh, they, they say to us that we are uh, reneging on our commitment in relation to teacher numbers. We've said repeatedly in this chamber that we want to ensure that the teacher-pupil ratio is maintained. But in terms of issues around teacher numbers, it would be interesting to note where the calls on teacher numbers are coming from. They're coming from Labour councils and they're coming from the Labour leader of COSLA. I sat on the Local Government and Regeneration Committee when the Labour leader of COSLA sat before us and said that he wanted to see greater flexibility being afforded to councils specifically in relation to teacher numbers, as did Labour-led local authorities. So before they come to this chamber and start lecturing the Scottish Government around the issues about teacher numbers, they might want to go and get their own little provincial houses in order in the councils that they are running at present and try and tell their councillors that they are the ones, that they are the ones who need to get their act together when it comes to uh, teacher numbers. Mr McIntosh. McIntosh. Rather than quote others, would Mr Macdonald remind the Chamber what the SNP's promise on teacher number was at the last election? Mark Macdonald. As Mr McIntosh well knows, the SNP inherited office in 2007 and Labour then wrecked the economy in 2008 and forced us into a situation where we had to manage our budgets in the face of austerity that first began under Alistair Darling and has since been continued by George Osborne. And he should check the record on that before he comes into this chamber and pretends that somehow the world was not changed as a result of Labour's economic mismanagement. Gavin Brown spoke about uh, progress. Inter I intervened on Gavin Brown and asked him what the progress was in terms of uh, unpaid taxation and collection of unpaid taxation. And he was very evasive in his response. And the reason he was evasive in his response is because the figure has remained stubbornly around about the £30 billion mark and has not shifted dramatically in any way, shape or form. Were it the case that the UK government were pursuing those individuals, those corporations who are not paying their fair share of taxation with the same level of zeal that they appear to be pursuing those at the margins of society, those vulnerable citizens, those vulnerable individuals, those, of the, the, those voiceless individuals who are unable to lobby or to, uh, to put forward their argument with perhaps the same ability that those uh, in the wealthiest stratas of society are able to do when they sit in the same gentlemen's clubs as certain members of the UK cabinet are able to do were that they had those same networks and opportunities, perhaps they would find themselves getting the same sort of feather duster treatment as the uh, wealthiest in society appear to be getting. Uh, so much for those with the broadest shoulders bearing the, uh, bearing the burden. It tends to be those uh, who are the weakest in society in terms of their ability to put across their case or, or in their ability to stand up 
to the UK government's uh, relentless assault on their incomes, who are the ones who are bearing the hardest brunt. And that, frankly, is an absolute disgrace. But what is a bigger disgrace? Presiding officer, is that we know that this is what we get close, from the Tories. We know that. We don't need to be lectured upon that. We know that's what happens when the Tories are in government. I think the biggest uh, regret that people will have is that up here in Scotland, we're being sold uh, the message that the Labour Party are somehow an alternative to this. They're not. They're simply a repainting of the same tired, old approach. That's all that is being offered by the Labour Party in Scotland, and they should just be honest about it. Yeah. Thanks so much. Now we call on Christina McKelvey to be followed by Ken McIntosh. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. It shouldn't come as any great surprise that David Cameron's coalition government policy is austerity for all, but especially for women. And it's certainly no surprise that Labour support it even in the corridors of power at Westminster today. The public schoolboy network that spawns Tory MPs like a mother frog blessing her tadpoles with some automatic right to power doesn't really get women. I would like to remind the Prime Minister and his acolytes that women make up a little more than half of the voting public, even in wealthy Tory seats in the home counties. And, presiding officer, I am not naive. I do not think for a moment that my drawing attention to this obvious reality will make the slightest difference to the policies of the current Westminster Government. That is why we do need more SNP MPs there to shift the balance. Nevertheless, it is worth looking a bit more closely at just how misogynistic those actions are. The family-orientated government is taking at least £360 a year off new mothers, in real terms with a combination of freezing statutory maternity pay and removing the health and pregnancy grant. Let's move along the age range a wee bit. Westminster's welfare cuts threaten to put another 10,000 of Scotland's children into poverty. That's 100,000 across the UK. The reductions in benefits will take away over £6 billion from Scottish households. If that sounds like too hard a figure to grasp, let me mention that £6 billion would keep our NHS for the whole of Scotland for a full six months. And Mr Finlay wouldn't answer the Cabinet Secretary's response on Mr McTernan's views on the health service, but maybe the Labour Party would like to answer this. McTernan, on the 1st of August 2014, in an article in The Times, said, privatisation, what is it good for? Everything. That's what I feel like shouting at the TV and radio when I hear Andy Burnham, the Shadow Secretary of Health, pontificating about the supposedly dire effects of competition in the NHS. That's how the Labour Party in Scotland view the NHS, an opportunity to make money. And maybe women need to go back to our caves and stop challenging the menfolk when they go out to slaughter the bison. I don't think so though it sometimes feels as if that's what Westminster would like us to do. Bedroom tax, disability living allowance, introduction of universal benefits and PIP. Not only are the policies fundamentally wrong, they discriminate specifically against women. Why? Because it's mostly the women who manage the care of disabled <coughs> children or parents who are among the 400%, yes, 400% increase of food bank users who have to somehow keep the house ticking over and put food on the table. Women in Scotland are still paid, on average, less than men for the same kind of jobs. And the benefit cap, introduced by Mr Cameron and supported by, yes, Labour MPs, is a clear attack upon single women with children. These households make up 60% of those affected. Then there is a reduction in child benefit, another attack on women. This was the one benefit that they could bank themselves. That's gone now. The proportion of childcare costs covered by working tax credit is reduced. That's, there's an increase in the taper rate for tax credits. There's a removal of the baby element of the child tax credits. There's a requirement for lone parents on income support with the youngest child aged five or six to move on to job seekers allowance. Then we've got universal credit system. Structure a single monthly payment which will be made for, to one person in a couple household with a single earnings disregard which may weaken the incentive for second earners, the women in the main, to work. Again, it removes women from the direct payment package. The First Minister of this Parliament has made clear many times that the benefit reform programme of Westminster unfairly impacts on some of the most vulnerable members of our society, particularly, yes, women, mothers and their children. And speaking of this government's agenda for change, there's the other elephant in the room, and we've heard much about that today, Trident. Westminster has given us the news, backed by Labour, 
at Westminster and obviously here today because they wouldn't answer the question that they intend to spend about 100 billion on replacing the existing system. How's that for prioritising? I would say it should be burns, not bombs. Of course, Labour's record on prior prioritising is doubtful anyway in Scotland. It was Labour that enthusiastically rolled out PFI so that we are now tied into private sector deals that strip out about £2.4 billion of our budget every year. Yes, the Scottish Government does what it can to mitigate, but until we have full fiscal control of welfare, we are limited in how much we can deliver. You have already heard some of the figures that show that commitment, and I'd like to just go back in history a wee bit. Paul Sinclair, remember him? I'm sure some of the Labour benches do. He wrote an article in the Daily Record a number of years ago when Angus Mackay, the then Finance Minister, was justifying the fact that... Now, what did he say? The Scottish Executive couldn't cope with the extra amount of cash. £718 million sent back to the Treasury by the last Labour government in this building. So let's not talk about underspends, eh? That's just an embarrassing fact. It's not the first to say that Scottish politics will never be the same again since the referendum, but I reiterate that. We indeed will hold the feet to the fire when it comes to securing a legitimate right to control our own budgetary policies. We will need to move on from the Dickensian view of the role of women and protecting our public services is exactly the way to do that. Thank you. I now call Ken McIntosh to be followed by Bob Doris. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And many of us will be pleased the Scottish Government have called this afternoon's debate. Teachers, hospital staff and public servants across Scotland are currently struggling with the impact of budgetary and political decisions already taken. And the forthcoming general election throws into stark relief the very future of the public services we expect and rely on. The Tory plans to reduce public spending to levels not seen since the 1930s finally gives the game away about the whole austerity agenda. An, e an economic crisis created by private spending and borrowing has been successfully used as cover for an attack on public spending and borrowing. Welfare, the largest part of which predominantly goes to pensioners, is portrayed as wasted on work-shy benefit scroungers. New laws are being mooted to prevent public sector workers from even withdrawing their labour. The Tories hide behind the argument of balancing the books, but their agenda goes way beyond that. Those of us who believe in the value of good shared common services, those of us who believe that they provide the backbone for a good society, the bedrock of a fair and prosperous society, as the motion uh, put, we have a battle on our hands at the next election and one that we have to win. But even beyond the political threat posed by the Tories, there are growing pressures on our public services which we also have to deal with. New demands, such as the demographic changes within our society. Healthier lives and medical advances, for example, mean that there are ever more of us living with dementia or living with cancer, and we have to respond to that demand. And I don't underestimate the difficulty of getting that right. Just this week, for example, uh, the, the, the well-intentioned uh, uh, English Cancer Drugs Fund uh, revealed uh, the limitations of such an approach with their, uh, under, with their overspend and um, cutting back on, on this available, uh, the availability of cancer drugs. We have not just growing demands too, but higher expectations. Uh, and just one example of that might be for uh, single patient wards. And the Scottish Government might try to adjust the targets, but as they have, I think, now discovered, if more and more people are waiting for longer than four hours for A&E, it's not good enough to say that's better than it was 15 years ago. So it is good that we have this debate today, and it is good that we resist the Tory approach, but that shouldn't blind us to the challenges we face, and we shouldn't pretend that the, the Tory assault on the public sector uh, allows us to evade or escape from our own responsibilities. Because the government here in Edinburgh are responsible for, and have already taken a series of decision, decisions. Choices are already being made, and it is not enough simply to bemoan how difficult those choices may be. Uh, I think Joe McAlpine earlier uh, quoted that universities have been offered some protection, but that's because colleges have been abandoned and 140,000 Scots have now been denied a learning opportunity because of that decision. We heard from the Health Secretary just this weekend that revenue for some health boards has been protected, but not for all boards, and that capital spending has been cut. And in other words, a confirmation, I believe, that the, yes, I will do, confirmation, I believe, that the Scottish Government are cutting NHS spending in Scotland in real terms. Robson. I give way to the Cabinet Secretary. No, that's not 
collect, uh, real term spending on the NHS has gone up by 4.6 per cent since 2010, and indeed all boards will get a, an uplift through NRAC and £380 million in 2015 16. All boards are getting more money, a record £12 billion, £3 billion more than you spent on the NHS. Ken McTosh. Uh, well, well, Clearly, I think the Minister yet again refers to revenue, and I would point uh, members to the Auditor-General's Auditor report, where she does reveal real NHS spending. And we also know that the Scottish Government has asked our councils to bear the brunt of the cuts. Uh, and so we have more than uh, 4,000 fewer teachers. And I, I noticed Neil Findlay was uncharacteristically generous towards the uh, Scottish Government earlier when he said there have been 40,000 uh, job losses in public sector job losses in the public sector, in local government. But the Scottish Government's own statistics reveal it's been 70,000 over the last eight years. Care visits are restricted to 15 minutes from carers barely earning the minimum wage, let alone the living wage. And public sector wages have been frozen, pensions restricted. These are all decisions taken here in Edinburgh by the Scottish Government, not by the Tories. Now, SNP backbenchers and ministers will protest that they have no choice, that they operate within a, a fixed budget. But of course, that's not exactly true. We know they have a choice because, for example, after much pressure from Scottish Labour, SNP ministers finally used their powers to mitigate the bedroom tax. In fact, Scottish ministers are the first to point out that funding decisions taken by the UK Government do not apply and do not have to be repeated here. And of course, it's also not strictly the case that we have a fixed budget. We have tax raising powers here in the Scottish Parliament and always have had since our inception in 1999. And that's where we get to the real difference between Scottish Labour and the SNP. Labour would keep the public finances under control, but would find additional money needed to find public services by restoring the top rate of income tax to 50p on those earning more than £150,000 a year. Mr Macdonald. Uh, I'm, I'm grateful to the member for giving way. The member appears to be uh, suggesting that more money should be spent in every single portfolio. Can you advise whether he envisages that the rate of taxation that he would be levying would be sufficient to fund the increases he's calling for? Or does he not accept that when you have a fixed budget that is being reduced, you have to ensure that you manage the finances across all portfolios appropriately? Ken McIntosh, well, you must begin to conclude, please. I, I, I'm just in the middle of outlining exactly where we would raise our money by restoring the top rate of taxation, by introducing a mansion tax which would fund an extra thousand nurses. Yeah. Now, these are choices that the, Scottish, that the Scottish Labour Party is willing to state publicly, and yet we cannot, despite repeated, uh, repeated offers, we cannot get one SNP member or one SNP minister to state that they would do likewise. They are not prepared to put their money where their mouth is. They I'm are not prepared to, close, to fund the choices that we wish to see. And until, presenting officer, until until the Scottish Government are willing to actually talk about tax rises or where they're going to find the money, if they continue to say that we should swap the pooling and sharing of resources for oil revenues, then I don't believe they'll get the confidence of the Scottish people. Thank you. I must indicate to members that uh, interventions are in your own time. Please, six minutes speeches. Bob Doris to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. Um, thank you, presiding officer. Uh, the theme of this debate is protecting public services, and a key aspect of any debate in relation to protecting public services must first of all identify which valued public services that we'd wish to see protected and, and flourish. And these benches... Mr ours, Doris, sorry, could you move your microphone up? Absolutely. Slightly? These benches, this Scottish Government has a clear vision for protecting our public services. So whether it's the restoration of free university education, something rejected by the Labour Party, or universal free school meals, the Labour Party seems to not have a position on it, anymore, or it may change from day to day, or the abolition of prescription charges that the Labour Party fought tooth and nail to oppose, whether it's expanding the concessionary travel scheme, something the Labour Party were seeking to reduce significantly, whether it's a more money for free personal care, whether it's an additional 1,000 police officers on the beat, or whether it's, and we should listen to this one course, carefully, uh, especially if Jim Murphy is listening, whether it's 1,700 more nurses in the NHS under this SNP government as compared to the last Labour Scottish executive. This party, this government, has clearly laid out our vision and what we see as protecting public services actually means in practice. So it's been clear from the investment Perhaps if there's time later, uh, Mr McNeill. Um, but what we don't know, of course, is where Labour's Cuts Commission is these days. Remember, 
everything's on the table, nothing's off the table, but they have been silent in relation to it. Perhaps Mr Murphy, if he ever finds himself in this place, hopefully never in a position of power, of course, can give us some more information in, rela in relation to that. But of course, any public service has to be paid for, something that will become increasingly difficult as the UK continues to accelerate its programme of savage austerity. And I note that today Ed Miliband will support the UK Labour government's so-called Charter for Budget Responsibility. And that Charter will sign Labour up to matching Tory budget cuts to Scotland pound for pound, million pounds for million pounds. And part of the process that will take £6 billion out of the welfare system in Scotland by 2016. These cuts are aimed at attacking our most vulnerable in society, and the Labour Party are wedded to them. For example, Labour's DWP spokesperson, Rachel Reeves, MP, said that they would be tougher than the Conservatives on benefits. Let us not forget that, tougher than the Conservatives. So, where does that leave the Scottish Government, where we see 100,000 disabled people in the firing line with further cuts to disability benefits or 100,000 children further to be pushed into poverty because of UK benefits changes or indeed the thousands of families who will be worse off because of the tax credit changes. I think Christina McKelvey gave a very good exposition of why this targets women and children in particular with these savage cuts. Well, the Scottish Government has pursued a policy of mitigation where it can, so it's £35 million in relation to discretionary housing payments to end the bedroom tax where we can in Scotland, so that no one loses out. £38 million for the Scottish Welfare Fund in the face of UK cuts. Funding of council tax benefit cut again by a UK Government. Reopening the independent living fund in Scotland. £100 million over £100 million, in fact, each and every year to mitigate. So not just about protecting public services, but protecting the public where we can. Also, and much has been made about the Scottish Government so-called underspend. Now, I understand the figure is £145 million that the Scottish Government, for a significant period of time, has already said will be spent in the financial year 2015 2016. Now, already with the funding bids, retrospective funding bids, I have to say, for how the Labour Party would already have wanted that money to be spent. So let's just give it to councils, let's give more to the NHS, let's give it to colleges, let's give it to schools, let's give it to care workers, let's give it to fire staff. Indeed, I have to say, um, it could be an eye-watering figure, because Mr Finlay said that West Lothian Council alone should have had £88 million spent on it. From that £145 million, I have to say, no credibility at all. But let me tell you what the Scottish Government has said. Mr. Finlay, no, the member you. doesn't seem to be taking the Scottish Government has said it will spend that £145 million. Remember, the Labour Party have spent it five, six, ten times over. I'm looking forward to adding up the financial bill that the Labour Party have, taught up, uh, have, have uh, accumulated today. The Scottish Government will spend it on economic support in these difficult financial straitened economic times. We will spend it to further mitigate the worst aspects of UK welfare reform. And let me tell you, presiding officer, when the Scottish Government makes those financial commitments, no one in the Labour benches should welcome them. They should actually criticise them, because they would have spent the money already. Gone. The bank is empty. No more money to spend protecting our economy. No more money left to protect the most vulnerable in relation to welfare reform. The cupboard would be bare. Absolute hypocrisy from the Labour Party. And I look forward to no exercise and arch deceit when the Labour Party do give their opinion when we spend that £145 million that we will do in protecting the Scottish economy where we can and protecting our most vulnerable Mr Finlay where we can. I trust this party, this government, in the face of savage UK Tory or red Tory Labour cuts after the next UK election to defend our public services. Close, and gee whiz, I hope we're in a position to hold the balance of power at the UK so we can protect the people of Scotland. Stuart Stevenson to be followed by Duncan McNeil. Uh, Presiding officer, let me start on a consensual note.
and uh, congratulate the Labour Party for the third part of their amendment, um, calls on all parties to work together to tackle inequality, support economic growth and proudly protect Scotland's public services. Now, that's pretty hard to disagree with. Essentially, of course, it just replaces the last paragraph of the government's uh, motion uh, with a slightly different uh, formulation, which they've deleted. But more significantly is what the Labour Party has taken out of the government's motion, which is most of it. Um, first, uh, one might uh, look at uh, deleting reference to and criticism of the UK government's austerity agenda on the delivery of public services. Well, obviously they agree with it. They're deleting it from the government's motion. Uh, secondly, the cuts for welfare of 15 billion. Again, they're deleting that from the government's motion. Clearly, that's something that they uh, uh, agree with. Now, Ken McIntosh uh, rightly made reference to government spending at UK level being the smallest proportion of national income that it's been since the 1930s. But, of course, at five o'clock, if he so chooses, he will vote uh, for a Labour amendment that deletes a reference to that uh, from the government motion. But the reality is the biggest and most important deletion that there is from the government's uh, motion relates to spending money on weapons of mass destruction rather than on other things. The way the motion is drawn is quite wide, covers all levels of government. And I want to just uh, spend a bit of my time on proper defence for Scotland and their interests. And of course it touches in the wider interests of the UK. Our soldiers, and we contribute disproportionately more from Scotland than elsewhere in the UK, when they were fighting in Kosovo, peacekeeping in Kosovo, had to use their own personal mobile phones for communication because the Army's uh, radios, the Mark IVs, were so poor that they did not work properly in the mountainous terrain uh, of Kosovo. That's because there was not money being spent on developing communication systems that were fit for purpose. When they were in uh, the Middle East, in Iraq, we had the sight of soldiers ordering boots by email from suppliers in the UK because the rubber soles on the boots the army had provided were melting in the desert sands. The equipment was not fit for purpose. And more fundamentally, in Afghanistan, where the UK has had so few helicopters that only 5% of soldiers have gone to points of application in helicopters compared to 95% of US soldiers going up there. The most dangerous part of their deployment, the travel from their barracks uh, to the point of application, as a result of which the casualty rate among UK military was 50% higher than US military because we're not investing the right money in the equipment for our troops. And that diminishes their effectiveness and leaves Scotland and the UK vulnerable. And of course, we've actually seen in the last week further evidence of the underinvestment because money is being diverted into weapons of mass destruction that will never be used in our maritime interests. Having to scrounge support from other countries when there appeared to be threats off our shores. Scotland has the longest coastline in Europe. In fact, our coastline is half of the coastline of China, one of the biggest countries in the world after Russia. And every single country around us has proper defence. The Irish have maritime surveillance aircraft. The Icelanders have maritime surveillance aircraft. The Norwegians have, the UK has none. The Irish have eight vessels posted around their coasts, providing coastal defence. The Icelanders have vessels. There's not a single vessel based in Scotland for the purposes of coastal defence or coastal support. So we can see that we are seeing the money that's being spent on weapons of mass destruction is not only depriving our public services and our public servants from the proper funding, it is not even serving the purposes of defence in any reasonable measure that one might apply to it. Until you get the basics right, matters such as weapons of mass destruction, and I don't make a moral case against it, easy to do that as it is, I make a simple pragmatic 
uh, case against the current priorities, which the Labour Party, in common with others, is deleting from the motion. So I automatically assume that Mr Finlay at five o'clock will be voting to spend £100 billion on new nuclear weapons and all his Labour colleagues will be doing likewise. Now, there's only two of us here, presiding officer, who were born, I think, before the health service. I won't name the other person. Um, and I am certainly very fortunate and others have been fortunate when the health service was founded. And the reason I'm fortunate is my parents were able to afford the approximately £50 it cost for an operation for my mother so she could conceive me and give birth. There may be those here who regret it. But the kind of benefit I got from my family is now through the health service extended to all our population. I congratulate the Labour Party on their having done that then would that they now adhere once again to the principles that carried the health service into being and resiled from the cuts agenda to which they are now irrevocably wedded. Thank you. Duncan McNeill to be followed by Jim Meade. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, I was joined that until the end, that wee change of uh, chart there and that, that contribution. Um, I look at Keith Brown's motion and... and you know, you, you mentioned, uh, Stuart, that there's not a lot that uh, we can disagree with, that the Parliament has a strong, uh, uh, strong public services are the bedrock of a fair and prosperous society and pays tribute to the public se uh, service workers who reach and the sentiments of inequity. Now, not many of us can, can, can disagree with that. In fact, there's an astounding amount of agreement about the collective way that we would provide our public services, how we would like them procured and uh, all of that. Why we've had the last couple of hours trading figures, finance, numbers, who did what, who cares more. None of us here have got a monopoly in care or a monopoly in, in respect for the public sector, its workers. Go on. Stuart Stevenson. To agree with the member that actually there are people in good heart and they're not all on the government benches. I just want you to step up to the plate in what you actually do. Duncan McNeill. In terms of, I wasn't addressing it personally to you, I was referring to your, your, your initial speech. I didn't mean it to, to be a personal attack on you, but I think it's a criticism of us all that when there's such agreement about what we should be doing, that we seek excuses for not doing it elsewhere. That's the point I'm going to try and make here. Because when I look at the emphasis on the, the, the financial crisis, the austerity that's come from that, and different policies that are being pursued from a, for, from a government and a party I've never supported, and it drew me into politics many, many years ago because of what the effects of those policies had on my community, uh, my neighbours and friends that I became involved in politics. But 10 years ago, we were discussing these. We had the care proposals, the care review about the health service a decade ago now, recognising that we had serious issues that we need to address in health. That the demographic challenge was going to put an impossible strain on our health services as they existed and as they still exist. And as winter crisis grows on winter crisis and those people are dealing with increased numbers going through the door. But we have been slow to see that as a priority. We ditched it many years ago and it's no surprise indeed that a decade on we hear the BMA and the RCN calling to review the care review. Yes, Cabinet Secretary. Cabinet Secretary. Can I very much welcome the tone of Duncan McNeill's contribution. Um, can I ask him whether though he thinks that you know, one of the biggest public sector reforms uh, that we've seen in a decade is actually the integration of health and social care, which takes place from April. Surely it's really important we all make that work. Duncan McNeill. Cabinet Secretary, I agree with you. We should make that work. But the fact that we had to introduce legislation to make it work gives us the idea of the scale of the challenge of the problem. A decade on integration of health and social care. You know, maybe we stop swapping numbers and fighting about numbers and who does what and does this and where the Tories are. Maybe we'd be addressing some of these issues. Five years ago, um, Crawford Beveridge, uh, uh, you know, uh, told us that we, we faced the worst financial 
crisis uh, the, the, since the war. And it was, it was a, a, he, was, he was asked by the current government to, to carry out an independent budget report. The purpose of that review was to present an informed and a dispassionate view of the scale of expenditure challenge that Scotland is facing over the coming years um, uh, in the light of the public spe uh, of spending and to look at options uh, of the con uh, discontinuing current uh, the, the, uh, and, and uh, discounting the current way of how we spend our public money. That was a challenge five years ago. It's, one of his recommendations, of course, was to discontinue the, 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 the council tax freeze. Another one was uh, to impose a two-year freeze on, on, on the council employees. It's strange that we can claim at this date that we chose to continue the council tax freeze but impose, uh, impose a wage freeze on some of the lowest paid workers in Scotland without any, any doubt. Now, if beverage provided the economic imperative for politicians in Scotland, in this, uh, this Parliament, who have a responsibility to address all of these issues, then Campbell Christie outlined the moral imperative about, of us acting. And limited resources, that's where the politicians are tested. It's all right when we've got money in surplus, now and in the past. The decisions are much easier. But the decisions with a declining budget are much more difficult. And that's where priorities must be put in place. And Christy, remember, said, Along, alongside a decade of growth in public spending, the money is not necessarily the issue, I think I would agree. And a growth where public spending has grown, inequalities have grown too. So when we had money, we didn't deal with the inequalities then. And it's all the more difficult now. We must conclude, Between please. the highest and lowest... I think maybe I'll finish at that point, presiding officer, and, and, and leave us with that challenge. Let's have constructive debate. Let's accept our responsibility. Let's use the money that we have wisely and to fulfil our commitment to reduce inequalities in Scotland. Many thanks. Jimmy Dee to be followed by Dennis Robertson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm very pleased to follow the thoughtful and constructive contribution um, we've just heard from Duncan McNeill. And I congratulate, uh, as did other colleagues, Keith Brown on his appointment as Cabinet Secretary and welcome Mary Fee to her front bench position. We've heard from speakers this afternoon that the UK government's austerity agenda has failed. I certainly agree with that, and I think it's a view that is borne out by a range of evidence from a variety of reputable sources. It has failed because it has impeded recovery and economic growth. It has failed because public spending, as we've heard, is at its lowest level in modern times. And it has failed on its own terms, because borrowing is now higher than when the coalition government came to power in 2010. Austerity has failed because it has hampered economic growth. The UK economy is now forecast to be almost 4% smaller than was predicted in 2010 when the Chancellor first entered office. The fact is that austerity is harming the economy, it is putting pressure on household and family budgets, and it is putting pressure on public services. Austerity has failed because public spending is at its lowest levels in modern times, that was the point made by Kevin Stewart and Ken McIntosh in their contributions. And as we heard, it will fall to 35.2% of gross domestic product by 2019 uh, to 20, and will probably be the lowest in around 80 years, according to the Office of Budget uh, Responsibility. Therefore, the reality of the government's austerity agenda is that total government spending will be reduced to its lowest level since the 1930s. And yet we know that the bulk of the cuts are still to come. The Chancellor has confirmed cuts of £25 billion, much of it from the welfare budget beyond 2015. Analysis shows that 60% of the revenue cuts to the Scottish budget are still to come. And the Institute for Fiscal Studies analysis of the Chancellor's autumn statement states the overwhelming fact about the public finance plans remains that spending in unprotected departments is set to have fallen by more than one third by 2018-19, with most of those cuts still to come. 
And the IFS go on to state a worsening of long-run public finances gives the Treasury extra money to spend now. That is not a sensible way to think about fiscal policy. And finally, austerity has failed on its own terms because borrowing this year will be £108 billion, £50 billion higher than the Chancellor predicted in 2010, which means that the total borrowing under this government will be in the region of £430 billion. So if we agree that austerity has failed, then what is the alternative? The Scottish Government has led the way in promoting an investment-led recovery by accelerating capital spending on vital infrastructure projects. They have protected frontline public services, in particular the revenue budget of the National Health Service, and they have mitigated the impact of the UK Government's welfare reforms on the most needy and vulnerable within our society. If we take capital spending, the Scottish Government has brought forward spending on infrastructure projects accelerated that spending to secure economic growth and create jobs. Just two examples, the investment in the fourth replacement crossing, supporting 1,200 jobs, and the Scotland's Schools for the Future building programme worth £1.8 billion. Now, that will deliver 91 new schools by March 2018, and this will include the new Muir High School at Fountain Bridge in my constituency and the new James Gillespie's High School also in my constituency. On the NHS, despite the cuts, as the Cabinet Secretary reminded us, to the Scottish Dell budget, the Scottish Government is committed to increasing the revenue budget in real terms for the remainder of this Parliament and for each and every year of the next Parliament. And while the Scottish fiscal resource budget is being slashed by 10% in real terms over the lifetime of this Parliament, the health resource budget has increased by 4.6%. Now, one of the biggest scandals within both the NHS and our public finances is the issue of the private finance initiative. The PFI contract at the Edinburgh Royal Infirmary is, as I've said before in this chamber, one of the worst examples of an NHS contract anywhere in the UK. And over the lifetime of the contract, the taxpayer will have paid out £1.44 billion in service charges. In the current financial year, this will cost the NHS £47 million. This contract is robbing the NHS today and well into the future of valuable resources which should be used to safeguard frontline NHS services, to recruit and retain hard-working healthcare professionals and to provide the high-quality patient-centred healthcare to the people of Edinburgh and the Lothians, which we would all wish to see. And that is why I am renewing my call for a full-scale parliamentary debate with the support of Unison and the British Medical Association on the operation of this contract. On welfare reform, Christina McKelvey was right to remind us that welfare reform impacts disproportionately on women as carers and single parents. Neil Fenley, briefly, please. Point on uh, PFI. Does he accept that uh, the government's NPD project is just PFI by another name? And therefore, if you're going to look at one thing, you must look at that also. Jim Eady. I'm very happy to have a, w a wide debate on NPD and PFI, but it's time for the you know, Labour members to come off the fence and to decide whether or not they wish to have that debate by backing my motion. Now, the NPD is an interesting point because the point there is that we need to factor in the investment that we are not able to make through the public loan route, which I would prefer and which the government would prefer because of the financial constraints and the borrowing constraints that we currently operate within. But let's have, that debate. Close, let's have that debate about PFI and NPD, and I look forward to that. Uh, presiding officer, in conclusion, I'd like to end with a quote from Unison Scotland's convener, Lillian Maser. She said, public services are used by everyone at each stage of life. We ought to see money spent on them, not as a cost, but as an investment. Surely we can all agree with that. Thank you. And I now call Dennis Robertson before we turn to the closing speeches. Uh, I thank you, Presiding Officer. In the Cabinet Secretary's opening remarks, he, he mentioned that <clears throat> for, we, we need to have public services which are sustainable and fair. And I agree that if we are to continue to provide our public services, they need to be sustainable and they need to be fair. And this is where I agree with uh, Duncan McNeill. We should be looking at ways on how we actually move forward, how we can actually protect our public services and at the point of delivery. No one in this chamber, presiding officer, disagrees that there's been austerity and there is greater austerity cuts to come. We perhaps disagree on the impact of those austerity cuts 
on, on different services. And perhaps we disagree on how the, the priority of this government has been to mitigate some of those uh, cuts that have come to Scotland. For instance, the mitigation in terms of the impact of the welfare reform has impacted on our most vulnerable within society. And when Duncan McNeill talks about tackling the inequalities, it's those sorts of issues that we need to tackle. I believe that some of the aspects and some of the, the, the programmes that the government have taken forward are the right ones. The Cabinet Secretary mentioned in his opening remarks concessionary travel. Concessionary travel isn't about just getting a free ride on a bus, presiding officer. Concessionary travel enables people to get out of their homes, to go... Pardon? To get out of their homes. Yes, I would indeed. Neil Finlay. Given that the member represents a, an area with a, a large rural population, for those people who live in that area where there is no bus, they don't get out of the house. Dennis Robertson. Uh, perhaps Mr Finlay isn't aware of the, the uh, support that both the local authority and stagecoach do provide within my own rural constituency. And yes, indeed, perhaps there are buses, Mr Finlay, that do get people out of their homes. Um, but can I say that the, the, the free the, is, is more to do with sort of health and well-being. It gives the people the opportunity, presiding officer, to take advantage, to take advantage of a service that they would otherwise maybe have to pay for, which again, against with the limited budgets, probably wouldn't be able to afford. Presiding officer, there's other services, the free personal care for the elderly. That's something that I think we should be able to agree on, and I think that we do. But is it about these choices? Last week, I was at the Aberdeen North East College, a wonderful new campus, a wonderful college, a college that's seeing the way forward, working closely with the universities, both in, with the Aberdeen University and Robert Gordon's. It's looking at how they can progress forward, looking at the, what is needed within the North East to sustain the economy of the North East, providing the skills and the training within the college sector. And they were commending the government for the work that they have done in bringing forward the agenda and bringing the colleges together within the North East. It was the right thing to do. Presiding officer, there are issues within the health service. No one can say otherwise. But I think the Scottish government have realised and have taken the appropriate action. NHS Grampian have quite rightly been criticised recently. No doubt about that. There was mismanagement within the board. There was mismanagement within the management sector. Absolutely. No one's shying away from that. However, they've got a world-class service. They've got a world-class new A&E department. Yeah, yeah. It was just mismanaged. The Cabinet Secretary and the Cabinet Secretary before went there. And Malcolm Wright, who's there at the moment, is taking cognizance of all those factors and putting things, I think, in, on the right path. The Cabinet Secretary yesterday announced the additional funding for NHS Grampian. That brings them to parity, presiding officer, with the other NHS boards in Scotland. Something that the Scottish Government had been working towards ever since they came into power in 2007. Presiding officer, there are many aspects of, the, of, of services that we need to applaud, I think, that the Scottish Government have been moving forward. And the protection of our rural schools, again, supporting our local communities within rural Scotland, that is something I think that we need to applaud. And yes, that takes more out of the public purse. Of course it does. But it supports our local communities and ensures that those communities survive. Presiding officer, free eye tests are something that I would commend to the benches in the coalition government and to Labour. Because I think they're Final viewing minute. the austerity programme through tunnel vision. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. Uh, we now turn to closing speeches, and I call on Liam MacArthur. Six minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, Deputy Presiding Officer, and thank you uh, for remembering my name. Let me start uh, as I did earlier. Uh, by reiterating my support and that of my party for the work carried out by all those who work in our public uh, services. I am under no illusions whatsoever how difficult it has been for them over recent years and indeed the challenges that are set to continue going forward. I believe that these are challenges that can be overcome, however, and this has already been demonstrated in the considerable innovation and cre creativity that we are seeing across the public sector. In difficult times, this does indeed give cause for some optimism. 
and the public sector workers deserve our full-throated uh, support across the chamber. That is not the same, however, as false promises or easy options that have more to do with short-term electoral calculations uh, than any long-term commitment to the public sector. Unfortunately, there has been too much of the former in a number of contributions uh, this afternoon, with honourable exceptions, I would have to say, uh, including those from Duncan McNeill and Stuart Stevenson. And Deputy Presiding Officer, if I may uh, echo the rather touching expression of mutual ad admiration that Mr McNeill and Mr Stevenson were in involved in, uh, I've generally found uh, Mr Brown a, a reasonable minister to deal with. We have had our disagreements, some of them uh, fairly vigorous, but he has always been approachable and willing to listen, even if not always uh, to act in the way that I would have wished. So the call from uh, Mr Brown today for all parties to work together to secure economic growth, tackle inequality and protect Scotland's public services is one uh, that I would normally be prepared uh, to take on board and take seriously. Unfortunately, the premise on which it is based is one that rather undermines its sincerity. For one thing, it presupposes that none of this is already happening. But that is simply not the case. Having denied that the coalition strategy for dealing uh, with the debt and growing the economy would ever work, the SNP now bluster that it is the wrong sort of economic growth and that we should be racking up more debt. In fact, it is growth and an approach to debt reduction that gives the best prospect for protecting public sector uh, services in the future. Little wonder then that the SNP's own fiscal commission emphasised the need to match the UK's debt reduction path for the foreseeable. Tackling inequality, too, is also taking place in trying circumstances. It is what lies behind delivery of the pupil premium, uh, free early learning and childcare for 40 per cent of two-year-olds from the most disadvantaged backgrounds, and free school meals for all P1 to P3 pupils. In each of these areas, the UK coalition has led. In response, the Scottish Government has followed, followed partially, partially or flatly refused to follow at all. Is there more that can be done to grow the economy, to tackle inequality, to protect public services? Absolutely. Uh, does that mean that the SNP is not taking steps in all of these areas? Absolutely not. But it requires more honesty from the SNP government about where we are now, as Ian Gray, I think, rightly suggested in his contribution, what the implications are of the choices that they have made, and a willingness to focus on using the powers we have and are set to take on to deliver these critical objectives. And unsurprisingly, perhaps the contributions focused on three uh, areas, and I'll turn to each of those now. In health, there's no getting away from the crisis that we're seeing in a number of areas, notably Grampian. And, and Mr Stewart, who clearly was put off by my pre-Christmas haircut, uh, was keen to, uh, was keen to, uh, uh, to focus on uh, Arbuthnot. Well, the, Arbuthnot, the review into Arbuthnot began in 2005, concluded in 2007, and the agreement from the government to take forward those reforms was in 2008. So I don't think it is unreasonable for us to question why it has taken seven years to address the problems of underfunding there. In my own health board area of Orkney... No, I've taken an intervention first time. <laughs> not, even, not even on that basis. NHS Orkney, where underfunding again has been a, 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 an issue, what we've seen is an increase that will simply go towards paying off the borrowing that's been required to make good that, under, that underfunding. In education, we've heard from a number of colleagues this afternoon about real pressures in our primary sector, in our secondary uh, schools, uh, but also in the college sector as well, who are coping with significant cuts. And local authorities put in a straitjacket by a council tax freeze that removes local accountability and flexibility to respond to local need. In Edinburgh, in Aberdeen and indeed Orkney, we are seeing relative underfunding. All represent areas where the Scottish Government has full policy and budget responsibility. As Ken McIntosh, and I think Mark Macdonald really by, by implication accepted, government is about choices, whatever the powers uh, that we have. Um, Duncan McNeill, I think, was right to point out that those choices become more difficult in straitened times, but nevertheless, they're the, 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 the stuff of government. Claiming credit for all the popular stuff, as Bob Doris was keen to rattle off, is only credible if you're also going to take responsible for what that popular stuff then prevents you from doing. 
And independence offers no panacea, quite the reverse. I think a number of members have referred to what has happened to the oil price in the course of the last six months. The White Paper suggested that with independence, we can ensure that taxation revenues from oil and gas support Scottish public services. Today, what we've heard is an alternative perspective based on tackling fraud in housing benefit and tackling tax evasion, both of things that, will be, that are a priority for the UK government, priority for any government, but are not the basis on which to found an alternative economic vision. We need to continue to anchor the economy in the centre ground, continue to move from economic rescue to recovery. I think the best platform for a strong economy, for a fairer society, for the high quality, sustainable public services that we all, as Stuart Stevenson acknowledged, wish to see is anchoring that economy in the centre ground. And again, I have pleasure in moving the amendment in my name. Thank you. Many thanks. Before we move on, could I remind members not to respond to interventions that they don't officially allow, because it makes it very difficult for our recording of proceedings. Could I also remind members that all members are supposed to be in the chamber for closing speeches when they have participated in a debate? And I, note, and I regret to note that Ian Gray is not in the chamber. I now call on Nanette Millen. Six minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd also like to welcome Keith Brown to his new role. I welcome this debate, hostile though it has been, if only to dispel some of the myths and scaremongering contained in the Government's motion before us this afternoon, which Gavin Brown dealt with in his opening speech. Given my particular interest, I'll focus on health. Personally, I've always felt that politics is demeaned when point scoring is used with regard to the NHS. Having begun my association with the NHS as a medical student 56 years ago and having spent my entire working life in the health service and most of my time in Parliament dealing with health issues, I'm all too aware of the constraints and pressures put on our frontline services. But to keep resor resorting to slogans such as the UK, gov UK government's austerity agenda when there's a real need to rein in public spending merely reinforces the narrow-minded approach taken by this government and its tendency to blame Westminster for all of Scotland's ills. Let's look at some facts with regard to the rest of the SNP government's motion. Harking back to the 1930s, long before even I was born, or the NHS was dreamed of, uh, looks pretty feeble. And yes, I am the other older member referred to, but not named by Stuart Stevenson. <laughs> there have been peaks and troughs over the years in the share of GDP going into public services. But this was 36% in the late 1990s and is predicted to fall to 35.2% in 2019-20. A fall, yes, but hardly the dramatic fall of SNP rhetoric. What I do agree with in the Government's motion for this debate is the need to pay tribute to Scotland's public service workers in all our public services, but as my experience most particularly all those, staff, all those who staff our NHS. Every one of these, from porters, cleaners, cooks, secretaries, associated health professionals and medical staff in primary, secondary and tertiary care. These are the people at the front line of NHS care. These are the people that patients depend on and these are the people, coupled with the patients they serve, who want to hear proactive thinking and cooperation from politicians, not the sort of point scoring we're increasingly hearing as election time approaches yet again. The NHS has faced many crisis times throughout the years of its existence, but there's never been a greater need for a united approach to dealing with the enormous pressures currently facing the service, as highlighted by Duncan McNeill. Nor has there been a greater need for cooperation between the authorities providing care for our increasingly elderly population, because only by the real integration of health and social care services focused on the actual needs of people can we expect to achieve our desired goal of people living at home or in a homely setting in the community um, for as long as, po as possible, so relieving some of the existing serious pressures on our overworked NHS staff. The Liberal Democrat amendment, which has some merit, actually points to chronic underfunding of the NHS over many years, particularly in some health board areas, and this is only now being addressed. Yesterday's announcement in Aberdeen of 5.2 million, for example, while it is very welcome, has only come in the wake of the recent crisis in NHS Grampian. a and &E problems are in significant measure due to the impaired flow of patients through the system, leading to bed blocking because care provision in the community is not adequate. Again, Aberdeen City Council has the lowest level of funding of all local authorities, as well as having to deal with competition from the oil and gas industry, which makes it difficult to recruit and retain carers within the city. The amendment put forward by my colleague rightly turns our attention. Okay. 
Cabinet Secretary. I just wonder um, if the, the member will acknowledge that actually Aberdeen City Council were telling me yesterday that they've actually got an underspend on their social care budget because of the very issues of the difficulty of recruitment and retention of staff. So would she therefore welcome the work that is going on to try and develop the key worker housing, affordable housing option for all public sector workers within the area? I think that is a range of measures that, that needs to be taken, but there is still a very acute shortage of carers within Aberdeen City. The amendment put forward by Gavin Brown rightly turns our attention to preventative spending, an area which the government appears reluctant to even consider as an alternative option to overbloated public spending. And we've today heard their usual arguments around this. The NHS budget has been fully protected by the current Westminster government, leading to Barnet consequentials of around £1.3 billion since 2011. And it is, of course, for the Scottish Government to determine how this money is spent. Of course, we don't always agree with their choices, but then that is politics. There are undoubted pressures in the NHS with the demography of an ageing population in Scotland and a lack of qualified specialists in A&E and in the field of cancer care, for example. There's also a need to address waiting time delays, which has led to an increased reliance on the use of the private sector, something denied by the SNP, but which has been accepted by health boards, such as NHS Grampian, as they strive to provide care within the time limits set by the government. On these benches, we fully support the principle that the NHS is free at the point of delivery and need and funded from the public purse. But we must have a real debate about how care is to be delivered in the future. Presiding officer, there are two areas of particular relevance which need to be addressed by the government, and these concern the Care for Older People Change Fund and the Integrated Care Fund. It's quite clear this government seems to be ignoring its commitment to a decisive shift to preventative spending. So can I ask the, the Health Secretary in her summing up whether she'll give an undertaking that the £500 million pledged by John Swinney in his spending review of 2011 will actually be honoured? And will she acknowledge the grave concerns expressed by Audit Scotland that has been little uh, progress in the radical change in the design and delivery of public services? To conclude, Presiding Officer, as far as health is concerned, my colleague Jackson Carlo and I are committed to the health service in Scotland and are happy to work with other political parties in the interest of delivering good patient care. But let's stop the blame game, stop living in the past and instead focus on where we go from now on. We need to think beyond this year's Westminster election and next year's Scottish Parliament election and get down to the very difficult but essential task of some long-term thinking and a coherent strategy for the future. I I you must the Gavin Thank name. you very much. I call on Jackie Bailey. Eight minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. So there you have it. The general election starting gun has certainly been fired in the chamber today. But, you know, this debate crystallises for me the choice that people face in the general election in May. If you inhabit the world of the SNP government, then it's all the UK coalition's fault. And, you know, whilst I reject absolutely the Conservative Lib Dem austerity plan because it falls on the shoulders of the most disadvantaged and least able to cope, I find it frankly oh, extraordinary, please. but not surprising, that the SNP SNP deny any responsibility, yet they must share part of the blame. But before I turn to the SNP's record, I want to spend a little time on the SNP's offer going into that general election. On the 8th of January this year, Alex Salmond said that the election is about full fiscal autonomy, the ability to raise and spend all of Scotland's taxes in Scotland. And I hear no disagreement from the SNP benches. And that's, that's really interesting because that indeed is a real flirtation with reality because what he is saying is that he will plunge Scotland into deficit with a rapid decline. Well, they sigh, but let's, let's just think this through. The rapid decline in oil price from $113 a barrel estimated in the SNP's independence white paper is now down at $48 a barrel Today, we would see revenues due to Scotland being slashed. You know, oil is not some optional extra that's quite nice to have. It is central to our public services. It makes up 20% of our tax base. And the reality is that's fallen off a cliff. At $50 a barrel, it means an 85% decline in revenues. That's almost $6 billion less spent on public services on an annual basis. That blows out of the water the SNP's position on cuts. The hypocrisy, frankly, is breathtaking because their cuts will be deeper and faster than even those of the UK coalitions. Now, let's just spell out what that would mean. 
It means cuts. It would wipe out the school's budget in Scotland. It would wipe out the cost of all the nurses and doctors in our hospitals and our community health settings. It would wipe out the entirety of the infrastructure programme for next year. So under the SNP's plans Order, for full fiscal autonomy, the Barnett formula would no longer exist. We would face £6 billion in cuts immediately. Now, how many schools and hospitals would that close? How many teachers and nurses would we have to make redundant? Instead, we have the security of the Barnett formula, guaranteed to continue in the vow and in the Smith Agreement, something I would have thought the SNP would welcome. And let me ask Mark Macdonald, who was it who warned how much Scotland would lose if Barnett was scrapped? Mark Macdonald. Uh, allow me to pose a question to the member. Um, the, new Labour, the new Scottish Labour Chief Order. of Staff said that Labour is committed to £20 billion of cuts if elected. What will the impact of that be on Scottish public Jackie services? Bailey. Um, I asked Mark Macdonald a question. He failed to answer it. Let me tell him, let me tell him, he'd do Order, well to listen, please. it was Nicola Sturgeon who warned how much Scotland would lose if Barnet was scrapped. In October 2014, she said £4 billion of cuts for Scotland that would result if the Barnet formula is scrapped, as so many Westminster politicians want. She said it in January, she said it in March, she said it in June, but scrapping Barnet is exactly what her former boss wants to do. So is it, no, we've heard enough from you, Mr Stewart, so is it full fiscal autonomy with billions of cuts, as Alex Salmon says, or is it deeper and faster than even the UK government, or is it Barnet that protects public spending in Scotland? Is it Nicola Sturgeon that's in charge, or is it Alex Salmond continuing as a backseat driver? And let's deal with the underspend of £444 million not spent at a time of growing austerity, not spent at a time when the cost of living crisis had a huge effect on families across Scotland, and this at a time when the SNP government were cutting budgets. Just think what public services could have done with that £444 million. Let me remind the SNP of the words of John Swinney. Long gone are the days when hundreds of millions of pounds of government money would be underspent each year doing nothing to help communities across the country. That was June 2009, really, I kid you not, presiding officer. That was when he claimed an underspend of about £30 million. Now it's 15 times that amount at £440 million. Teacher numbers down, college places cut, bursaries cut, and an underspend of £160 million in education. I'll take Shona Robinson on why her government is failing the people of Scotland. Cabinet Secretary. Well, I wonder if Jackie Bailey could answer two points. One is, uh, given that the £145 million of that, which can be put into public services, has been done so by John Swinney, the rest of it is actually financial transactions and account managed expenditure like student loans, which Jackie Bailey, as a finance spokesperson for her party, must know yep. cannot be redirected into public services. And finally, can she answer can along, why, please? when she was a minister, you didn't spend Order. £718 million? Jackie Bailey. Let me just remind her of the words of John Swinney. Long gone are the days when hundreds of millions of pounds of money would be underspent. Well, we've heard enough from you. But let's look at the SNP record extremely quickly, presiding officer, in education. Teacher numbers down by 4,000, a 10-year low. The promise of smaller class sizes broken. 140,000 college places slashed. 10 million hours cut from learning. Schools starved of resources. In health, A&E services struggling despite the best efforts of staff. Some hospitals closed to new admissions. People on trolleys for 14 hours, for 17 hours, in one case for 20 hours. It is ridiculous. But bed numbers have been slashed. There's real pressure on social care. And we see a spike in delayed discharge. 65 million of Barnet consequentials is welcome, but you know it doesn't begin to address the problem. And then we have the 12,000 patients who've not had their 12-week waiting time met. That's 12,000 who've been denied their legal right by the same government that legislated for it. Let me, let me compare health spending in England and Scotland because... Members in the last minute. This is an interesting table. Um, it is the case 
that health spending in the UK, in England, has gone up by 4.4%. Health spending overall in Scotland has dropped by 1.2%. That came from Spice. I would prefer to believe them than I would you. Neil Finlay was, of course, right to ask you about the loss of public sector jobs. More than 40,000 fewer public, public sector jobs across Scotland, the majority of whom, can I say to Christina McKelvey, are women. But let me finish with a word on which party is actually progressive. Because it is Labour that will have a top rate of income tax of 50 pence so that those with the broadest shoulders pay more. It is Labour that will introduce a mansion tax that will fund our pledge of a thousand more nurses and more. And it is Labour that will tax bankers' bonuses. The SNP, they simply want to cut corporation tax even more than George Osborne. They want full fiscal autonomy. Oh yes, that would see six close, billion please. of cuts in public services. That's the choice, presiding officer. Fiscal autonomy with huge cuts with the SNP or the security of the Barnet formula. The SNP you have been rumbled. They are prepared to sacrifice public services rather than on reducing inequalities in Scotland. Thank you. And can I remind members to address the remarks through the chair, please? A call on Shona Robison to wind up the debate. Ten minutes, please, Cabinet Secretary. Is it um, only me that uh, remembers uh, Jim Murphy's comments about the change of tone that we were going to see <laughs> under his leadership, that the Labour Party were going to cease being the anti-SNP party? Well, I have to say there's not much sign of that today on the Labour benches. This debate has given us uh, an opportunity to reflect on the importance of our public services and the, the vital role played by the, the spectrum of people that teach, treat and serve our communities everywhere and in so many different ways. All of us respect and value the people who work in our public services and I think uh, Duncan McNeill uh, was right on that point. That isn't uh, just uh, something that should be uh, um, any part, one part of this chamber. We all care, but we do, of course, have different uh, policy uh, priorities in terms of how we think that should be delivered. And I'll come on to say something more about that in a minute. As the Cabinet Secretary said in his opening remarks, the five years of austerity already imposed by Westminster have resulted in real term cuts. We have challenged this wrong-headed approach on many occasions in this chamber and beyond, and we will carry on doing so. And despite their cuts, ours is a different approach in Scotland, and we will continue to invest and prioritise our work to protect and enhance public services as far as we are able to within the powers of this Parliament. It should be noted in a minute, it should be noted that while we were having this debate, in this Parliament that Tory MP David Mowat was on his feet in the Commons making the case for a Tory Labour coalition oh. after <laughs> the election based on Labour just having supported the Tory austerity cuts in today's vote. So you cannot come along to this chamber calling for more money for every single part of the public sector when your members have just gone through the lobbies with the Tories to support austerity cuts that will affect this place as well as down south. Yes, of course. Jackie Bailey. Um, I think the Cabinet Secretary seems to forget that from 2007 to 2011, she relied on the Tories to get a budget through. There's a partnership for you, I, Cabinet I, Secretary. I think that's called a, trying to find a straw to grasp upon. <laughs> but, of course, Jackie Bailey, Jackie Bailey was just a few minutes ago praising oh, dude, the please. Tories' record on the health service. So aligned uh, and, and such a fan, is she, of, of the Tories' uh, spending priorities down south. But let me come on to the health service, because it is a very important uh, subject and one very dear uh, to me, and what a, an honour it is to be the Cabinet Secretary for Health. But I don't for a moment underestimate the challenge. Duncan McNeill was right. There are challenges, there are real challenges going forward, and ones that we absolutely, hopefully, and sometimes collectively, uh, take forward uh, across this chamber. But let me be very clear. We are absolutely determined that all patients in Scotland should be treated as quickly and as effectively as possible with the right care, in the right place, at the right time. We have committed 
to increasing funding, despite Scotland's fiscal resource budget being slashed in real terms by 10 per cent by Westminster since 2010. We have made sure that the health resource budget has increased by 4.6 per cent in real terms since 2010. That means more money for doctors, more money for nurses, more money for the health service. Next year, the health service will see an uplift of £380 million, which is £54 million greater than the Barnet consequentials allocated from Westminster. What does all all that mean? It means more doctors, it means more nurses, building on the 1,700 nurses, additional nurses already delivered by this government. So be under no illusion, we will protect the health service. But the £12 billion that will be allocated to health next year is a lot of money, but it's what we do with that money that is so important. And that's why we do need to look at redesign. And one of the biggest changes of public sector reform we have seen in a generation is the integration of health and social care. But we absolutely need to make sure that that integration leads to the better quality of service and integrated services that our older people in particular absolutely deserve to see. As I've said many times since becoming Cabinet Secretary for Health, we do need to tackle some of the issues within our system. Tackling delayed discharge is my top priority, and we have been working very hard with partnerships over the last few weeks and months to make sure that we do that. And over the next few weeks and months, I will absolutely make sure that we get to the point of eradicating delayed discharge out of the system, because it means that beds are not being used for people who need them, and it means that the resources and the health service are not being delivered to the optimum that we need them to be uh, delivered to. Yes, of course. Duncan McNeill. The Cabinet Secretary decided, uh, described lots of money going into the health service, but sometimes that can describe the chaotic nature of the health service and they follow crisis rather than planned. Ten years ago, Malcolm Chisholm uh, instigated the care review and he recommended a more preventive approach. Campbell Christie did that five years ago. Do, measured against those proposals, are we achieving that shift from dealing with the day-to-day -to, -day to the preventive, to, to, Thank you. To, where Secretary. we need to spend that money? There's some signs of that, but not enough, and we need to do more. And when we come to talking about the 2020 vision, I'll have more to say about that, because you're absolutely right. Any money we leave in through integration has to lever the big change because that integrated partnership will have £7.6 billion at their disposal across Scotland. That is a huge resource. So any money that we put in uh, to that system has to be about levering that shift of the balance of care. And I'm very happy to work with Duncan McNeill and anyone else on uh, making sure that we see uh, that happen. I want to use the rest of my time to try and, and respond to uh, some of the points made uh, in this debate. Can I say uh, to, to Mary Fee, who unfortunately uh, wouldn't take under interventions on this point, uh, the issue uh, of the, the, the so-called uh, underspend um, just showed the, the paucity of, of the Labour arguments and the fact that despite Jackie Bailey being challenged with the facts, would not accept that every penny, every penny of that underspend that could have been spent and redirected to public services has been done. Order, the rest of the money cannot be transferred to public services and it is disingenuous, disingenuous in the extreme to pretend otherwise. And Order, as a finance please. spokesperson for the Labour Party, Jackie Bailey, it worries me incredibly that you think that money for student loans can, can somehow be redirected to public services. I'll give you another chance Order. to explain how you think that is possible. Jackie Bailey. The, the Cabinet Secretary is very, or should be very clear that the opportunity was lost to spend that money in year when it was needed. There is no denying that. She has starved the NHS and others of money that they required in year by that underspend. Cabinet Secretary, once again, Abs I remind members of the need to speak through the chair. nonsense. You cannot spend money, you cannot spend money that is account managed expenditure on other things. As the finance spokesperson Order. of the Labour Party, you should know that. And it shows, it shows an extreme 
do, it shows that you do not, if you do not have a grasp of those facts, yes. then it's very worrying for your party. But can I say it's hypocrisy in the extreme as well, because as has been said on a number of times during this debate, when you were Minister Jackie Bailey, you presided over... Cabinet Secretary, please, Cabinet Secretary, please address your remarks through the chair, please. Sorry, Deputy Presiding Thank Officer. When you were a minister uh, in this government, through the chair, when, when you were a minister in your Order, government, please. Jackie Bailey, you presided over £718 million being sent back to the Treasury. John Swinney, John Swinney has made sure that every penny of the underspent that can be directed to public services has been done so. Every penny has been transferred to uh, public spending priorities, and quite rightly so. Uh, can I say to uh, Kevin Stewart, I very much welcome his welcome of the £65 million uh, share for NHS Grampian. I think it's really important that we address some of the old funding formula hangover that was from our Arbuthnet through the NRAC formula. And I'm very proud that it's been this government that has actually done that and made sure that NHS Grampian and others have the resources they need. But for those resources, let me very, be very clear, NHS Grampian and others have to start delivering on their targets and delivering improved patient care. It was interesting that Neil Finlay had a, a lot to, to say about uh, about pay policy, but at no point during his speech did he say anything about Labour's pay policy. But what we do know, presiding officer, about Labour's pay policy is what we know about Wales, the only place in the UK where Labour are in power. And let's look at what Labour have done. They did not implement the 1% Agenda for Change pay rise for staff in Wales. So they say one thing... Or to the Cabinet Secretary is concluding. They say one thing when they're in government and one thing when they're in opposition. But their record, their record speaks for itself. I'm afraid so you must draw in to conclusion, a uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, I'm very happy to stand here in defence of our public services because our record speaks for itself. The opposition's, there's nothing there to speak for. Thank you, Thank you very much. That concludes the debate on protecting public services and it's now time to move on to the next item of business, which is consideration of motion number 11985 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on approval of SSI Public Services Reform Inspection and Monitoring of Prison Scotland Order 2014 draft. Could I ask members who wish to speak against this motion to press the request to speak buttons now, please? And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to formally move motion number 11985. Minister. Formally moved. Many thanks. I have two members who are requesting to speak against the motion and tend to call them. Um, so I now call Margaret Mitchell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I rise to oppose this SSI, which, on the basis of the evidence to the Justice Committee, I firmly believe will not result in the establishment of a superior system for prison monitoring. Whilst acknowledging that there are serious doubts about the proposed new system and whether it will be OPCA, i.e. optional protocol to the Convention Against Torture compliant, the Scottish Government is nonetheless proceeding merely because it doesn't want any further delays. OPCAT's express purpose is to establish a system of unannounced and unrestricted visits to all places where persons are deprived of their liberty. To this end, state parties must guarantee the functional independence of the national preventative mechanisms, as well as the independence of their personnel. As the visiting committees were resourced by the Scottish Prison Service, they lacked functional independence and were therefore non-OPCAT compliant. A problem which could easily have been resolved by removing their functions to the Public Service Ombudsman. The committees, all of which were staffed by dedicated volunteers whose visits were all unannounced, could have then become a part of the UK National Preventative Mechanism, a view endorsed by Dr James McManus in his evidence to the Justice Committee. Instead, there has been a four-year delay during which time the government's position has shifted dramatically from its seeming acceptance and approval of the COIL review recommendations. Now, the system outlined in the order erodes the impartiality of independent prison monitors in at least two distinct ways. Firstly, in terms of the IPM's 
visiting arrangements, a rota must be provided and agreed by both the prison monitoring coordinator and the prison governor. Additional IPM visits can be undertaken with the agreement of the coordinator and only then, if time and resources permit, is there room for unannounced visits. Final minute. Secondly, the internal complaints process tasks monitors with the responsibility of assisting prisoners with internal SPS complaints, uh, thus creating a perception among prisoners that monitors are essentially part of the SPS and not independent. Presiding officer, whilst there was room for improvement in the current visiting committees, if this order is approved by Parliament this evening, then an inferior system will have been put in place. Quite simply, it's more important to get the independent monitoring of prisons right than to rush this order through, which is why I formally move against the SSI this evening. Many thanks. And I now call Alison McInnes. I can give you two minutes. Thank you very much. The Justice Committee's report on this SSI is laden with provisos and caveats, in my view far too many for comfort. Regular, rigorous, independent scrutiny of our prisons is essential to ensure proper standards of care and decency are maintained. These proposals do not ensure that monitors are truly independent. Instead, they will sit in a hierarchy with the work of independent prison monitors directed by salaried coordinators. They, in turn, are overseen by the Chief Inspector of Prisons. Further compromising their independence, the monitors must undertake routine visits in accordance with a rota agreed with the prison governor. There are significant concerns about the capacity of monitors to undertake an expanded range of duties, whilst the right, time, the right to time off from employment to undertake monitoring is removed. And there's also concern about the reluctance of the government to commit to at least a minimum number of monitors. The order also fails to protect the confidentiality of prisoners wishing to raise concerns with monitors. I too want the system to be OPCAT compliant sooner rather than later. Nevertheless, the shortcomings in the order, highlighted by the Association of Visiting Committees, Howard Lee Scotland and the SHRC, have to be heeded. Professor Andrew Coyle, who reviewed the government's initial ill-judged plans, has concluded with considerable regret that this latest effort needs further amendment. We are asked too often to rely upon the Cabinet Secretary's willingness to monitor and respond to legislative shortcomings rather than sort seconds. them out first. Despite a number of attempts by the government to get it right, members are today being invited to pass an order we know to be deficient. Perhaps one last iteration with a new minister at the helm will bring a resolution that we can all support. Scottish Liberal Democrats will therefore oppose the order tonight. Many thanks. And I now call on Michael Matheson to respond. Five minutes maximum, please, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, the order that Parliament has asked to approve today has been subject to significant consultation. It has also been examined by the Justice Committee, and I should say that I am grateful to the Committee for that detailed consideration of this matter. The order meets our obligation under the UN Convention Against Torture, OPCAT, and the National Preventative Mechanism, which the current system of prison visiting does not. It establishes an independent monitoring service for Scottish prisons, ensures that all aspects of prisons are fully and independently monitored and provides a system where best practice can be readily be identified and improvements made in relation to the conditions in prisons and the treatment of prisoners. Officer, there are a number of critical reasons why I believe this chamber should today approve this order. The new system will deliver improved outcomes for prisoners and wider society. The current system of prison visiting committees is not as effective or efficient as it could be. There are significant inconsistencies across individual visiting committees, a lack of accountability and no ability to look at trends or share findings. The new system will introduce effective leadership and governance arrangements for monitoring that will be addressed in these areas. Independent prison monitoring's independence is secured through the oversight of the Chief Inspector of Prisons. In addition, presiding officer, independent prison monitors will be given the power to visit the prison without prior notice at any time, access to any part of the prison, speak with any prisoner privately, and investigate any matter a prisoner brings to them. The new system 
provides the visits to be undertaken in three ways. To be arranged through a rota agreed by the independent prison monitor and the prison monitoring coordinator and the prison governor. To be arranged between the independent prison monitor and the uh, prison monitor coordinator. And to take place at the discretion of an IPM alone. Any concern that wholly unannounced visits may no longer take place are totally unfounded. It is also wrong to suggest that unannounced visits will be infrequent. The reason for allowing for visits to be agreed with governors is that this allows governors to raise specific issues that may be discussed and shared with the IPM or for the governor to be able to highlight to prisoners that an IPM will be available on a certain day. The reason for some visits being agreed with the PMC is to ensure coordination and appropriate frequency of visits. A combination of announced and unannounced visits is consistent with the practice used by the European Subcommittee for the Prevention of Torture and the Principles of OPCAT. A key element of the draft order is also that it requires IPMs to visit each prison weekly. This will ensure a regular frequent visit of uh, monitoring of what is going on in individual establishments across the whole of the country. Officer, the system will also be subject to regular review. The order requires the Chief Inspector of Prisons to I will give way to uh, the member. Elaine Murray, briefly, please. I yeah, am um, grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for taking an intervention. Uh, I know that much progress was made during the discussions with the committee, and I wonder if he would be able to repeat the assurance he gave us that, under review, if there are problems with the order, that he would be prepared to return to that and amend it if necessary. Cabinet Secretary, you are in your last minute. Thank you, officer, uh, the member raises a good point because the order requires the Chief Inspector of Prisoners to, Prisons to set up an advisory group to keep the effectiveness of monitoring under review. Membership of that advisory group will be at the discretion of the Chief Inspector uh, and he's indicated that it should have an independent chair and should include the Scottish Human Rights Commission. And of course, if there is any indication that there are difficulties with the present approach or deficiencies within the present approach, then as a government, we'd be more than happy to reconsider those matters as and when they are highlighted to us. In closing, President Officer, I would like to make clear that this government is committed to delivering the best outcomes for prisoners, tackling inequalities where they exist and meeting our obligations under OPCAT. The order that this Parliament has been asked to approve today was approved by the Justice Committee, seven votes to one. This will reform independent monitoring of our prisons and it will deliver better outcomes for prisoners. Many thanks. That concludes the debate on public services reform. Uh, inspection Monitoring of Prisons Scotland Order 2014 draft and the question on this motion will be put at decision time to which we now come. There are five questions to be put today as a result of today's business and I would wish to remind members that in relation to the debate on protecting public services, if the amendment in the name of Mary Fee is agreed, then the amendment in the name of Liam MacArthur falls. The first question then is that Amendment 12034.2 in the name of Mary Fee, which seeks to amend motion number 12034 in the name of Keith Brown on protecting public services, be agreed to. Are we agreed? No. Parliament is not agreed and therefore we will move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now, please. Order the result of the vote on amendment number 12034.2 in the name of Mary Fee is as follows. Yes, 35. No, 78. There were two abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. Could I remind members that in relation to this, the, the debate on protecting public services, if the amendment in the name of Gavin Brown is agreed, then the amendment in the name of Liam MacArthur falls. 
And that brings us to the second question, which is that Amendment 12034.3 in the name of Gavin Brown, which seeks to amend motion number 12034 in the name of Keith Brown on protecting public services, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Parliament is not agreed, and therefore we will now move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now, please. The result of the vote on amendment number 12034.3 in the name of Gavin Brown is as follows. Yes, 13. No, 65. There were 37 abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. That then brings us to the third question, which is that amendment 12034.1 in the name of Liam MacArthur, which seeks to amend motion number 12034, in the name of Keith Brown on protecting public services, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is not agreed, and therefore we will move to a vote. And members should cast their votes now, please. Order the result of the vote on amendment number 12034.1 in the name of Liam MacArthur is as follows. Yes, 39. No, 63. There were, no, uh, sorry, there were 13 abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. That then brings us to the next question, which is that motion 12034 in the name of Keith Brown on protecting public services be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is not agreed and we will now move to a vote. Please vote now. Order. The result of the vote on motion number 12034 in the name of Keith Brown is as follows. Yes, 60. No, 54. There were no abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed to. And that then brings us to the final question this evening, which is that motion 11985 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on approval of the Public Services Reform, Inspection and Monitoring of Prisons Scotland Order 2014 draft be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is not agreed, and therefore we will move to a vote. Members should please cast their votes now. Order the result of the vote on motion number 11985 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick is as follows. Yes, 98. No, 17. 
There were no abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed to. And that concludes decision time. We will now move on to members' business. And could I ask members who are leaving the chamber to do so as quietly as possible, please?